Okay, thanks, Caleb. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, August meeting. Hard to believe it's August. Uh, Howard's Golf Committee meeting. And uh, with a quorum uh, present, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, just make a couple of announcements. Uh, there's a disclaimer at the end of the agenda, and uh, it, it allows me the flexibility to entertain things that might have not been specified on the agenda. And Carol Fuller uh, contacted me uh, earlier this past week and uh, requested to uh, speak at the end. And I sent out a little note to everybody. And sorry, Carol, I didn't characterize essentially uh, what she wanted to do. She's going to speak uh, more fully to uh, member participation within the group as far as uh, you know how we might more effectively uh, uh, interact with each other and with Roman, et cetera. Uh, and I'll let you amplify on that. But I, you know, the way I presented it, it sounded more like community outreach and uh, not necessarily that. And also Steve Bellotta, uh, uh with uh, looking forward to the uh, uh, budgeting calendar, uh, not the calendar specifically, but uh, is, is, would like to address the committee in terms of uh, budgeting strategies as we go forward. And uh, the season is almost upon us. I, I probably, I hope I'm not misspeaking, but this is about the time that Roman usually gets direction through the uh, town administrator's office as far as the budget calendar is concerned. I expect it in September. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think it doesn't I'm ahead of September. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was looking at some of the old ones, and and this is the time, and there is a very specific calendar that uh, you know they do follow. And the important thing, like I brought up at the last meeting, is especially that midget, uh, excuse me, the message from the selectmen as far as what their intent is this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, without further ado, uh, I'm really pleased to uh, have with us uh, tonight uh, uh, Michael uh, Walk, and uh, he represents the Howard Conservation Trust and uh, is going to amplify on some of the points that we uh, shared uh, at the last meeting. And uh, because of the TV positioning and everything, I'm going to switch seats with uh, um, Michael as well. And uh, if everybody's amenable, uh, before we get into the consent agenda, the director's report, I, I didn't want to torture Michael too much. So we're going to give you the cameo premiere spot here okay. first, OK? okay sure. So I'll switch with you. and. Uh, Obviously, after his presentation, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thanks, Mike. Come on up here. I can go higher than that. I only had a margarita. Much more. Oh, hi. hi, everyone. Hi. It's hi. nice to see you, meet you. Um, Welcome. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Clem. Uh, so Michael Locke, the director of the nonprofit Harwich Conservation Trust. Just by way of background, uh, many of you probably, not all of you are familiar with Harwich Conservation Trust, HCT for short. But it was founded in 1988 by citizens from all walks of life with a, a common purpose, and that is to try and preserve natural qualities really rooted in the natural landscapes, preserve those natural lands across Harwich um, to protect uh, scenic views for the public, uh, walking trails, wildlife habitat, coastal water quality, pond water quality, drinking water quality, since we derive our drinking water from one source, that sole source aquifer, the groundwater. Um, all of those environmental elements really creating the, the quality of life that draw, drew us all here, draw so many more every year, especially this time of year. By the way, it's a great day to be outside golfing. Um, Rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> and that really hold us here, uh, create those, those Cape Cod experiences and memories. So that's what we strive to do. Um, at a Harwich Conservation Trust, and thanks to a volunteer board of trustees and uh, staff, uh, one of which I am a part of, and really our dedicated core of volunteers, um, we've, we've helped to protect over 600 acres. Um, many of those instances in partnership with the town, 
we also engage in uh, many meaningful volunteer events and activities for folks to get out on the land uh, to help in different ways through citizen science projects or trail maintenance or other innovative, interesting ways to protect land, water, wildlife, habitat resources. And so at Clem's invitation, I'm here to explore in a preliminary way uh, perhaps three uh, ideas of collaboration. And there may be more, but I will just present them maybe in about eight to 10 minutes, leave room five minutes for questions. And uh, since I want to respect your time and your agenda, perhaps we, we pick those up another time or perhaps another idea is to have a working group, subset of your group um, that might be able to focus more on them if you wish, if you wish. Um, before I talk about those three potential areas of collaboration, I did want to also reflect on a very active trustee uh, who um, you know, sadly passed in 2014 in October. That was Bill Baldwin. And Bill uh, uh, helped organize the golf fundraiser um, through Cranberry Valley Golf Course for uh, nine years, uh, raising uh, several thousand dollars each of those years towards the trust's land conservation uh, work. So thank you uh, and your predecessors for that collaboration and how you collaborate with other nonprofits to raise much needed funds for many important local causes. Thank you. Um, we also have collaborated in the past on protecting, uh, finding and certifying, protecting vernal pools around the perimeter, the wooded perimeter of Cranberry Valley Golf Course. Um, uh, we worked again uh, with, with uh, your predecessors, perhaps some of you were around that time, 2007, 2008. And Sean Fernandez is actually a past trustee of Harvard mm -hmm. Conservation Trust. So there, there's a lot of um, cross-pollination here uh, between Cranberry Valley Golf Course and, um, and HCT. Um, <clears throat> my brother's an avid golfer, but he lives in Texas. So maybe sometime we'll get him up here to play uh, Cranberry Valley. Bring him up? Yes. So the three ideas for collaboration. Um, first, I'll mention, again, in a broad sense, uh, this concept of protecting the land that is the base of Cranberry Valley Golf Course. Right now, we know it is used uh, wonderfully for recreation, for golfing. That doesn't mean it will necessarily always be so. Uh, if uh, times change such that there are pressures that create the impetus for a conversion of use from golf. We can't imagine that right now, right? Conversion to a different use, then that, risk, that land would be at risk. Um, one way to perpetuate the protection of that land while also accommodating the current and ongoing use of uh, golf as a recreation would be to place a conservation restriction on the land. That's a tool that Harvard Conservation Trust utilizes with landowners. Um, it's basically an overlay protection. Um, we, again, we could talk about that concept in more detail at another date, if you wish. In thinking about that idea, that long-term protection vision, I thought also perhaps something for your committee or perhaps the town to explore would be a co-benefit of that long-term protection. And that is the, the potential, I say potential, because I think it bears out more research, the need for more research, um, to perhaps earn the town nitrogen credits to offset its wastewater infrastructure costs. We know that the town has been experiencing costs that have been exceeding estimates um, laid out during the process of creating the town's comprehensive wastewater management plan. Not surprising, right? It's a, a, a long-term project to address the coastal water quality issues, mainly the de deterioration caused mainly by septic system nutrient loading. So the concept could be, what if a conservation restriction on the town land, that is the Cranberry Valley Golf Course, while accommodating continued golf course uh, use, could somehow offset taxpayer costs for the need for wastewater infrastructure because of nitrogen credits accrued by the protection of that land. It's a concept, something worth investigating, especially, I think, in light of the fact that 
I believe the selectmen are now in a process of revisiting some parts of the comprehensive wastewater management plan. And if I read the CWMP correctly, it looks like the Sacklatucket Harbor watershed was scheduled to be addressed as part of the CWMP in phase eight. And the Herring River watershed in, in phases four through seven. So we haven't reached those phases yet, but there's planning already underway. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that you as a committee want to think about, perhaps discuss in a, a, a way to, to, to discover more about this concept, whether it holds water or not, um, and to see if it's a good fit. The role ACT could play would be the holder of that conservation restriction as your local entity, as we have uh, provided that service on other partnerships with the town and vice versa. The town holds conservation restrictions on some of the lands owned out, outright by Harvard's Conservation Trust. So it's not a new tool, but this concept of earning uh, nitrogen credits to offset wastewater expenses for taxpayers would be a different aspect. So that's one idea. The second idea would be to explore um, the possibility of collaborating on creating and monitoring uh, songbird nest box. I know you already are engaged in that activity. Well, Harvard Conservation Trust is as well across five different conservation sites, more than 100 songbird nest boxes. We have a dedicated core uh, of volunteers who maintain those nest boxes and um, keep track of nesting success data. And they've been doing so for over 10 years. So it's very interesting to see the changes in some songbird nesting success. Um, for a variety of species, whether that's eastern bluebird, black-capped chickadee, tufted titmouse, house wren, or American tree swallow. The largest site that we have nest boxes is the Robert F. Smith Colebrook Preserve. That's right off Bank Street. We have 45 nest boxes monitored by volunteers there. And again, like I said, we have nest box monitoring volunteers who go out during the season, April to, say, July, at four additional sites. Maybe there's an opportunity to collaborate in that effort. What do they actually do with the uh, <coughs> monitoring? How do they monitor them? Yes, great question. Um, <coughs> they try to disturb <laughs> the nest box inhabitants as little as possible, but weekly they visit these nest boxes to gather information on any um, nesting material, uh, any um, eggs, any nestlings, and then any fledglings. And by gathering that data, we have a sense over time of what, again, the nesting success, that's basically how many birds have grown and successfully left the nest, fledged, versus how many, if any, eggs were laid in the nest. So we have some interesting data that we've been collecting. Um, and we've been able to visually represent that on some uh, bar graphs to show the changes over time. That might be interesting for a uh, Cranberry Valley Golf Course. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as, as, a to, um, as you're probably aware of, we've been dealing with, over the last five or six years, Audubon certification, Audubon International certification. And anything like that, Martha, I see that as a, as a great kind of uh, marriage of sorts, you know, where on our sheet, as far as what we're doing proactively, uh, I think it would enhance our profile as far as they're concerned. There's no doubt. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt. Yeah, I, I would think so. I, I like that idea. We have to work with Sean also. Sean, yeah. <laughs> yes. Great. Yes. yes. A third possible area of collaboration is um, the potential for any walking trails, obviously, that don't interfere the ongoing uh, use of the golf course. Could that be seasonally when there aren't um, uh, folks out on the greens? Uh, could it be in conjunction with the nearest adjacent conservation land, which is the <coughs> town-owned Texera conservation lands? The trailhead is located on the south side of Queen Anne Road, not far <coughs> from the intersection with Oak Street. Um, so could there be some linkage there? Uh, and if there is, what would the extent of that trail addition look like? Again, you're in the driver's seat as to what, if any, of these work 
for uh, Cranberry uh, Valley Golf Course best interests. So those are the three ideas uh, to date. Um, and I'm going to leave it there again out of respect for your agenda time. My, my yeah. question, just a question on what, what does a nitrogen cre credit do? Conceptually, uh, my understanding is that it would um, provide the town um, relief uh, in having to outlay um, a certain amount of funds to sewer otherwise. So we're exploring this concept in our partnership with the town selectmen on the Colebrook Ecological Restoration Project, that site I mentioned earlier, the Robert mm -hmm. F. Smith Colebrook Preserve. So recall back in 2017, town meeting voters authorized <coughs> $2 million to be put towards um, the um, eco-restoration construction. And what is that going to look like? That site is roughly 66 acres. It's in the uh, Sacotucket Harbor watershed. Again, to be complete here in the description, Sacotucket Harbor is identified as impaired coastal water body. A certain amount of nitrogen has to be removed from that coastal water body. One of the ways to do it is to sewer X number of houses within the watershed upstream. Another idea um, is to reduce the amount of sewering in the Sacramento Harbor watershed by naturally reducing nitrogen. And what we're doing with the town is partnering toward that end by naturally uh, reducing the nitrogen through our ecological restoration project. The town, through its CWMP, and you can see this reference in the CWMP, through a feasibility study uh, that was funded through a prior town meeting vote, identified the potential uh, to save up to $6 million by supporting this eco-restoration project. Voters, again, authorized $2 million. So investing $2 million, save $6 million. That's by reducing the sewering potential of 175 homes within the Sacramento Harbor watershed. What if the same concept, although not through eco-restoration, but through um, extinguishing future subdivision potential on the Cranberry Valley Golf Course was applied through conservation restriction. The Sacramento Harbor watershed spans most of Cranberry Valley Golf Course and then some of Herring River watershed. So you have two watersheds sending flow down to nitrogen impaired water bodies. Perhaps it's a, a concept worth exploring. And so how would Cranberry Valley get a nitrogen credit? I think, I think that's a, it's, um, a concept that you would have to explore further with uh, CWMP consultants hired by the town, whether that's CDM Smith uh, or is it um, SMAST as well, School for Marine and Science Technology at UMass Dartmouth. See if this has bearing um, with this scenario, with this hypothetical. We know that the idea is being applied to the eco-restoration project further uh, down, further south in the watershed. This is looking at the concept higher in the watershed, more northerly in the watershed. So again, my goal was to relay, relay this as a preliminary concept. The next step, if you're curious to learn more, I think would be to bring it to um, folks that are um, have been applying or utilizing these ideas uh, in other towns or in the CW CWMC planning process for Harwich. So I would consult, um, uh, you probably have to go through the, uh, I think it's is it the Wastewater and Water Commissioners, is that the board now that governs that? Dan Peltier oh, so might be the Wastewater yeah. Commissioner as well yeah. as the, so perhaps it's a question to address to him and then see uh, where that goes. I think Paul may have uh, given us a synopsis of the amount of land in the town that, that HCT has been involved in preserving or protecting. Uh, uh, how many sites and what's the overall acreage? Mm. So of the roughly 600 acres that HCT has helped to preserve, um, roughly two-thirds of that is owned outright uh, by HCT, and the other third is subject to... Um, is, is represented by conservation restriction held by HCT on town properties or on private lands. So the conservation restriction, again, as an overlay tool is very versatile. Um, 
the conservation restriction has come in handy when the town needs to qualify for state grants, which can offset taxpayer cost when acquiring some of these open spaces. Um, and so uh, we're glad to be a partner to that effect. Vice versa, uh, when there are state grant, when there's a state grant program called the State Conservation Partnership Grant, uh, which is devoted solely to land trusts, nonprofit land trusts, when we qualify for those grants, they expect a conservation restriction and overlay protection to be held by another entity. We often turn to the town to help us in that regard. Um, so uh, it helps offset our expenses um, since we uh, rely on raising these land saving capital funds um, on citizens, folks like you and your neighbors who really from a grassroots perspective make these land saving projects possible. And I, I will say, I think at this point, um, I have not seen the development pressure be this intense on this community or in the Cape um, since the 80s. Um, now, we all need places to live and work and recreate, but I think we're also at uh, kind of a crossroads when we see the deterioration of our coastal water quality. We're seeing the expenses being borne by taxpayers long term by the need to create these um, sewering programs. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other uh, consequences. So if we can work together in a smart growth way to try and identify and preserve places that are most sensitive and that also perhaps have co-benefit for reducing taxpayer burden long term, it seems um, like a win-win. How is our land at Perfect Valley right now classified? Purely recreational? Uh, I believe it's recreational, John. Uh, under that umbrella. I, I, was just, uh, I was just taking a look at your first objective, which is really protecting the, uh, the whole Fairbury Valley uh, structure that we have in place right now. Yeah. And uh, what suggestions would you have for us to move forward so that that cannot be infringed upon by other groups or somebody in the town that wants to? Yeah, when you're taking the long view, the long view for that property. Uh, Perhaps that's a question for town council uh, to see if the conservation restriction would be a viable tool to reach that goal. Um, and again, at the same time, see if that intersect of nitrogen credits is a co-benefit. So there's a couple resources in town that you may have access to, whether it's Dan Pelletier whoever, or whoever he might suggest, uh, and then also town council from the, um, the conveyancing standpoint. To do nitrogen credits, so you'd have to have a pretty good idea of what the nitrogen usage is right now. Or yes, within the Sacramento Harbor watershed, right? Looking at it from a watershed perspective, again, a question for Dan Peltier uh, relative to the CWMP and what data has been gathered to date. Would that be broken down to Primer Valley in terms of nitrogen? Uh, I don't know. I'll, I know that in reviewing CWMP, they break it out by impaired watershed. And uh, like I mentioned, the majority of Cranberry Valley is in the Sacramento Harbor watershed, but then there's also a portion of the Herring River watershed. So it crosses watersheds, although the majority appears to be in the Sacramento Harbor watershed. Uh, yeah, Jim. Clem, I, I thought in one of our previous meetings, isn't there a, already a restriction on the land that says it only can be used for recreational purposes? Well, that's correct. That was the original. That was the original. Correct. but. Okay. As things in this town tend to get lost in translation, I think this idea yeah, of makes collaborating in the one prevented the other. Carol, I mean, it's just another overlay protection. That another layer of protection, and uh, as as you mentioned, I, I mean, I see it as a win-win. You know, I think as a committee, we can certainly look at this more in depth. I like your idea of spinning off perhaps a subcommittee to you know look at this because it will take or require I think uh, you know some investigative uh, work on our part and, and just as a point of information because we've talked about it going forward uh, as far as allocation of water resources are concerned we've talked about gray water usage for irrigation purposes you know when whatever happens you know finally gets uh, you know finished 
So, you know, I, I think we're very much in step with, you know, your ideas as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I just, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, and appreciate your time. Any other questions? And a, and a little bit of a departure, but folks, okay? Uh, Mike, thank you very thank you. much. Um, thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Very yeah. yeah. informative. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here we go again. Rainbow <laughs> time. <laughs> what if so I get stuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just looked at the uh, signs and said yeah. somebody gave it to me. Gave me some land? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, as he alluded to, I mean, the pressures that have been put forth, and I, and I think I think informally, uh, I believe the meeting was over, but uh, a couple of people referenced uh, the proposed 96 unit construction above the fire station. And when you look at that nitrogen impact and, and the impact in general on that watershed, because it's, John, it connects Forest Street to Grassy Pond, and the eventual outflow ends up uh, down on the harbors. So, I mean, we're, we're all kind of interconnected here uh, in a way. So, uh, We'll come back to that. Uh, if anybody has any ideas, feel free to share them with me. And uh, you know, I, I I really like that idea of perhaps the overlay protection that he alluded to, that first goal. And Roman, in terms of uh, impact on the golf course, uh, you know, as far as the nesting boxes and all that, you know, that that depth and degree. Uh, oh, that's a they have the program. they have the volunteers. They could probably do that without intruding on us. Yeah, we we would work with them obviously on yeah. on placement. Yeah. But I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I think what do you guys happen. think about the? Uh, I was thinking about the winter, as well. You know, we're obviously we're not playing. Well, I'm looking at, <laughs> except for Jack apparently playing golf in the middle well, of winter. You realize, <laughs> but uh, uh, but you, you know that Roman. I was just thinking that might be an opportunity for. You know some interactions. You know, absolutely. I mean, there are people that like that experience versus Florida. <laughs> I'll take Florida, but uh, you know, as far as a winter activity, yeah, I mean, it's uh, great to take yeah. on in the winter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have boxes already up. I don't know yeah. whether yeah. you're part of that yeah. or not. But we do, have. but I think it, this would take it to the next level with all the volunteers and the right. data. I, yeah. I think it's a great idea, and, and as you mentioned, Clement would. Um, Definitely be a good addition to our eventual Audubon application, without and, a doubt. And Martha, you got close, but you know, with all the challenges of our capital project and everything, I mean, I know it's a tired whatever subject, but the Audubon initiative. I mean, with this kind of impetus, uh, you know, I think it would be incumbent to have Sean. I mean. Not that he's got to do it all, but give us a punch list. Right. I mean. Well, he yeah. he has been working on yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. He I, has been. So, it's, you know. But certain things have come in the way, whether right. it's like our capital improvements. Right. Well, one big one that we're facing, yeah. that we're hoping to get past it, is the, the budgetary course. restrictions, too, because we remember before the pandemic, we were going yeah. uh, into an organ more organic program on, right. on the golf course, right. and uh, and that which is more expensive. And when they, with the restrictions on uh, our budget, it's really set us back as far as being able to explore more with the organic products on the golf course. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, okay, uh, back to the agenda, people. In terms of uh, public comment, I didn't receive anything directly from anyone except uh, Ms. Deary uh, just uh, gave me a copy of a letter. And I'm sorry if Mary sent this to my email, I did not get it. Uh, so uh, pursuant to this, uh, you know, I, I can scan it and I'll circulate it with the uh, committee and, and if that seems to resonate with you, we'll, you know, we'll address this subject, okay? What's it about? It's, it has to do with uh, certification of, uh, I just got it, John, uh, certification of, of the uh, T's and uh, a discussion of the rating of of, uh, of the women's golf uh, course as such, 
and as a result of the operation, the MGA was notified to recertify. I, I guess this deals with the red tees and the rating as such. So. Is this the new handicap system? No. no. It's a Sounds like course rating. Oh, all right. Course rating, yeah. And in the green green well, tee distances. Green, green right now is not correct. Well, uh, according to Mary, uh, and, and I'm just bear with me. Uh, Point number two, she says the green tee distances for these two holes are incorrect on the scorecard. They should be 135 yards versus 116 yards on the card for hole four and 112 yards for hole 17, Roman, versus 150 on the card. So, you know, we can... Let me, let me uh, if yeah. you don't mind, give me a copy of the oh, letter. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. It. Okay. Is the uh, insinuation that those two holes with the yardage would impact the rating? I, I reached out to, the, I've had a conversation back and forth that Ellen and I have through, throughout the season on a lot of these issues. And uh, I reached out to Mass Golf as well as USGA, and they allow a plus or minus 100 yards uh, uh, with, without changing the rating. Um, just because, you know, every day you move the tees around based on different things. And, and uh, so they, they allow plus or minus <coughs> 100 yards does not impact the rating. John, this is a lot more complex yeah. than you're just asking that question. I mean, and we've been dealing with it for mm -hmm. three years. So I think it would be imperative if Clem agrees to get people on the committee a copy of the letter, read it, and and understand what the issues are. Yeah, I I mean I'm confident that we can uh, bring it to resolution. It's certainly not that complicated. Well, I, well, I would like to take just one point. They may say 100 yards, but as an example, for a woman with a tee box of 100 yards for a par three. And then to say, but you could go to 200 yards for that par three, that does not really make any sense. The, they're, they're giving a 100 yard disparity over the entire golf course. So yeah, I mean, it, that, that's just, that's their uh, guideline for it. Uh, if, if your yardages change less than 100 yards, they, they don't consider that a qualifying uh, reason to be re-rated. They consider your rating is still um, certified. 100 yards in total yard. Total, total yard. Yards, yeah, plus yeah, or minus across, 100 that, yards total. That was something. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can under, understand that. However, when you go hole by hole and there's a difference of 50 yards or 75 yards, or it does make a difference to all of us. Sure. I, I think... Um, we'd look in, we, we could look into any questions yeah. that come up. I haven't read the letter, so I don't want to act like yeah. I, I know what's in the letter. I've obviously been in many conversations about rating, and I've gone back and forth with Mass Golf. Uh, they consider our rating, in effect, certified, and unless any major changes happen to the golf course, uh, not um, in line for re-rating. Okay. Uh, We'll, we'll take that Any under consideration. Any idea why you didn't get the email, Clem? I'm sorry? Any idea why you didn't get the email? I, no. It was don't. sent twice. I, and you didn't get any error message? That it wasn't? I did changed? not. Uh, and that's not to say that I didn't trash it in my junk file. I mean, I just get bombarded. Do we I, have, do we have a quote unquote we do. Golf committee email we do have address. a golf committee uh, email, but off the top of my head, I can't. I'll go back to Foster, and uh, you know we could use that for, you know, for in-house transactions. Yeah, That's thinking, a good idea. I mean, we could do that, and then and then if there was an issue with certain yeah. spam or, or or security yeah. settings on an individual, yeah. if it went to everybody on the committee, chances are yeah. at least one of us would get it. Steve, let me look at it. I mean, I'll get a hold of Foster. What you're talking about, Steve, is a distribution list, not a not a mailbox. Right. Yeah. Well, no. I'm, I mean, it could be either. It could be a separate mailbox too, so that we could and we could just tell the public 
if you have issues like yeah. this that you want to have addressed, and send it, send it to, to that mailbox yeah. as opposed to. Oh, and Steve, to Steve, to that point, uh, that's why I'm just. I don't know, it's maybe two or three years ago, the town was very interested in us doing exactly that, to eliminate the problem of Gmail, Hotmail, or, you know, A -D AOL, sorry, because uh, all of that theoretically should go away. However, true or false, Roman, the in-house, no system's perfect. In-house, the town has had its challenges haven't they? Sure. As far as emails concerned. So, but I think it's a good suggestion. I'll get a hold of Foster and, uh, you know, get us up to speed. If you need any yeah. help with it, yeah. uh, okay. Foster, let me know. We did a great job yeah. rebuilding the, um, the the golf community website a few years ago with Caleb. I, I, right. I'd be shocked if if there's not a link to email addresses on that website because yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd have to look pretty back. comprehensive I, website. You should be able to send it. There's, there's one. Central place, all of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Without any other uh, uh, comments, uh, to move to the uh, consent agenda. Uh, thanks to Mike Surgeon's hard work. I love the way he condenses. Uh, I seek approval of those July minutes. I make a motion to accept the minutes, absent any corrections that are presented. Thank you, Paul. In a second. Second. Okay. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, our director's report uh, uh, from Roman Greer. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this to, uh, I was in the town administrator's office, and, uh, you know, we are, I think, certainly lucky. Uh, it's, it's very much appreciated, Roman, the, the idea of the PowerPoint presentation. It encapsulates you know, everything, and it gives us a permanent record of, uh, you know, what what has transpired in our meeting, at least from, uh, you know, through your efforts. So thank you very much. Well, where did that uh, scam come from? We've had it for a while. I'm well, not even sure. Yeah, that, 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 that's been our is that what I, yeah. For a while. Yeah. It's nine years old, at least. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell. It is. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, the dirt area, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you mean our beloved old car barn might be in that picture? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, well, here's, sure. where, here's where the new car barn is, and it's not there. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. So uh, just to get started, um, before I get into what, what I sent out, I'd love to um, mention that just as I did la last meeting, we are really in the heat of uh, season um we're really high season, we're really busy. So I'd like to recognize some of the challenges our staff have put up with this season. Um, it's been very challenging from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, in, in July, we had a lot of rain threatening. So uh, Sean Fernandez and Rob Donovan did, did some really good work with water management as far as, you know, um, tracking what was scheduled to rain overnight and what actually did and when they should turn on the system when they shouldn't. But when I hear about how great the condition of the golf course is in, those are the decisions that really make the golf course, um, put, put the golf course in the shape it's in. So I want to really um, recognize them for their hard work. The maintenance staff as a whole, with the heat and humidity we've had lately, imagine riding a piece of equipment for four or five hours, you know, in, in the 88 degrees with all the humidity we've had. So. Uh, really great work by those guys. Um, as we have gotten into the humidity, um, disease control has been huge. And Martha, you mentioned, you know, not seeing any disease on the golf course. That's, once again, Sean and Rob tweaking their uh, spray applications just perfectly. So really doing a good job. Uh, on the operation side, we, we've got a, a large volume of play. Um, you know, I'd like to recognize Mike Sarajan for his work with Golf Now. As the committee knows, we made the move to do online payments through Golf Now. It's been wonderful. We've had a whole new population come into the golf course um, that use Golf Now. It's been very difficult uh, to find a nice equilibrium as far as reporting goes and in the back end. And Mike has been really a central figure in making that work. We found that we've we've got a nice uh, operation going for as far as reporting it, but it's been very challenging. We've gone through a number of different ways. What's really challenging is how you handle. Uh, um, cancellations uh, through golf now and, and it, it's just it's been it's been an accounting difficulty so 
appreciate Mike for all his hard work with, with that and with the rest of our staff as well. Uh, Dick Fagan has run the golf tournaments and leagues all, all season without the help of an intern. Normally we try to uh, hire an intern uh, for the season that, that would help with tournaments. We interviewed a bunch. We never landed one this year, so, so Dick has done a great job uh, running the staff as well as all the, all the uh, tournaments without an intern. This time every year we lose a, a big part of our uh, staff, which is our students. So we, the young people that work on our staff in season are a wonderful part of our staff. And with them packing up to go back to school, uh, it's going to be very challenging for our staff as Clay does not drop off, but, but our staffing does. So uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate all the hard work our students did, and, and uh, I'm going to appreciate even more hard work that, that those, the staff that stay behind uh, are going to face because it gets it gets to a difficult part of the year. Um, we are, as we hit August every year, we have challenges with. Uh, this is just when it seems like tempers and patients get high with with customers. So I'm dealing with a handful of code of conduct violations by annual pass holders for you know abusive language towards staff, uh, staff feeling threatened, not following staff directions, and unfortunately this is standard in August. So uh, you know I. I'd appreciate everybody, I'm not speaking to anybody in this room, but in, in, for the public record, uh, you know, please recognize that the staff are, are doing a great job, working really hard, trying to accommodate, and, uh, and you know, I think, I think it's the fact that people are, as the end of the season comes and families are packing up, there's a lot of pressure on people. We sometimes see people with less patience than normal, so, uh, you know, I, I'd uh, appreciate um, People treating the staff the way they deserve to be treated because we're really lucky to have the staff that we have, and, and they're, for the most part, not working there mm. to get rich. I mean, they're, 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 I'd love to see them getting paid more. They're there to be part of the Cranberry Valley experience more often than not, and uh, I'd like to see them treated better. Um, so, what has come of these uh, situations? So, what I, I was going to mention when, when they raise to a certain level, I'm going to bring them to the golf committee uh, because we've had that in the past where we've had yeah. hearings in the past. What I try to do is handle them one-on-one uh, -on -one where, where I, I, I talk to the person and try to handle it by ex explaining the situation and, and uh, having an apology to the staff member that was offended or, or was, was the victim. So um, I, I've been able to handle it so far on that level, but if, if I can't, I'm going to um, bring it up to the golf committee level. And, these, and <clears throat> just to reiterate, these are annual pass holders, members. The one, yeah, the ones I'm dealing with right now are. Roman, do you have a sense that the circumstances of the last couple of years have contributed to this, or is this an annual issue? You know, probably, Paul, but but also it is annual as well. I mean, this is this is August throughout uh, history at, at golf courses in our area. I mean, it's just, for some reason in August, it, it, uh, you hear the same thing at restaurants. Restaurants like have restaurants. Yeah. 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 How abusive. Yeah. I mean, so it's it, unfortunately it comes no excuse time. for it. No, no, there, there is no. There is no excuse for it. The I, one take, thing I, I take the membership away from them. The thing I would say um, is, is that's uh, the ultimate threat. The, the yeah. golf committee did a great job a few years ago with our code of conduct policy, and, and so every member signs uh, recognition of the code of conduct policy, and that, that gives um, a lot of power. So that when I do have a, a talk with an annual pass holder, it's the core of it is it's a violation of the code of conduct policy. It might be time to uh, reinforce that, Take if you will. Look at it. Well, not just the policy. I think the policy, as written, is 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 pretty darn good. But you know, maybe a, a wake up call to the membership. You know, the you know just tell it like it is. There've been several instances of abuse and. Uh, we won't tolerate it. Well, the and there, the and staff, there are, and, there are and, and we can even suggest that the record demonstrates that we will take action. And we can. We do. Yeah. Robin, we do on our lease. Do you a, a sense of how many uh, people are involved? Um, I, over the course of the season, I've had, I mean, it depends what rises to what level. Um, we, we've had a number of people on a, on a lower level that, that don't respect uh, the rules of the golf operation and are constantly trying to um, 
get by on, on the, like the Chelsea system uh, changes that, that I worked with Jack last year, trying to manipulate the Chelsea system. Uh, we've had situations where um, a particular family doesn't like to follow the direction, and so you know, we had a um, lightning uh, delay um, a few weeks ago, and the people showed up for their tea time uh, right after the delay, and so we were running 40 minutes behind on the tea, and they refused the direction of the staff and said, I've got the 840, I'm on the tee. And, then, and so refusing directions of the staff is once again a violation of the policy. Uh, using abusive language, you know, employees feeling threatened is, is very uh, uh, serious. But um, I'd say over the course of the season, it's a half dozen. Three of them are active right now. That, that I'm, I'm uh, look, looking for apologies to staff. And, and, uh, but, but again, I, I just want to point out, I don't think anything's risen to the level. Yeah, if it turns out that when I have a conversation with these folks and they choose not to apologize to staff or they're repeat offenders, I, I won't hesitate to refer it to the golf committee. Mm -hmm. What happened to the guy who was threatening to kill people with his club out there? Yeah, that, that was just a daily incident, so nothing occurred there. That was a... Um, that was between the parties, I think. Yeah. The, between, the two between guys two. were playing with each other. Oh, no, two, uh, two adjoining groups. Yeah. Um, That's what that was. Okay. Yeah. But that, that seems even worse than yeah. being rude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've had, really? I mean, we've had yeah. police to come to the golf. I mean, yeah. we, I, I, I've reported this to the golf team before. We've had police come to the range last year because, you know, um, tempers got high and, and uh, this, this, this yeah. happens. I, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't think the golf committee should address every one of these because they happen all the time. Sure. I, try, I try to handle all of them. And, and for the most part, I've had good success with it. The, the thing I'm more worried about is repeat offenders where they, they, they apologize to the staff, they, they recognize what happens, and then they just continue with the behavior. Don't you have the authority to do that, Roman, without the committee? Um, you know, we, we, we had a hearing a few years ago, and, I mean, and I what, was there you, what was determined was uh, it was better to have the um, – before we went to a suspension level, it, it was uh, our town administrator determined he'd rather have a hearing with the golf committee to hear both sides of the story. Um, I think it, I, I think it resonates with the concept of due process, and and that's the you know reason for uh, the committee involvement. I, I think it's a better unified you know position to have. Well, then it doesn't become personal either. Right. It's, it's more like a, a yeah. Right. Yeah. And the golf committee is is. Yeah. A great threat that I use when I talk to them. I say, you know, if we if we can't come to a resolution here, I'm going to refer this to the golf committee, and and uh, what they're they're intimidated by coming to you. It normally comes to resolution well, when we get be. to that point. Do you keep track? Of, <laughs> do you keep track of the of, of the people? So in particular, I'm I'm particularly focused on the repeat offenders. I mean, you. you you call somebody, you talk to them, you say, and they say, okay, fine, I'll go, I'll go apologize to the starter or the, or the, the kid in the, in the shack or whatever, and the next week they do it again. Yes, I, I do keep track. I have an incident file that so I keep maybe, track. So maybe we create a policy that, you know, once they're on that first list, if, if they do it again in the, in, in the same fiscal year, by default it comes here. Any repeat offender that's that Roman has taken his time out of yeah. his very busy day <clears throat> exactly. to deal with this stuff, and then they do it again? I don't know if a policy is required. I, I, I will, if I feel like I'm not getting anywhere with somebody, okay. I won't hesitate to bring it forward. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, anybody can lose their temper once, but the repeat yeah. offenders, after you've yeah. talked to them, there's no excuse. Please. All right, let me keep cruising here. What happened when the person uh, said, I have an 8.40 tea time and I'm going off? Well, the, the, uh, the, once again, they, they were telling one of our students that, that was in the starter house uh, and uh, being, using bullying behavior for him, and they got on the radio and called the manager on duty, who happened to be Dick Fagan, and uh, Dick went down and told them, you're, you're not on the tee. You're, you're, you need to follow the directions of the staff and wait until you're, you're uh, told it, it's your tea time. So the kid handled it right? Yeah, absolutely correctly. Yeah. Absolutely correctly. Oh. It, was, it was a young lady. Good Good for her. Yep. <laughs> That's a shame. Well, okay, so uh, I'll cruise through some stuff here pretty quickly. Uh, as far as the project goes, uh, the charter grid has been completed. 
we we're still awaiting the final bill from them, but they, they never submitted any change order, so that, that, that project was done on budget. We're waiting for our electric engineer to complete the punch list. But I, I met him on site and he tested all the um, outlets and uh, they all tested positively. I had our uh, easy go golf cart salesman by to take a look at the job to see what he thought of it. He said it was one of the best setups he's ever seen in any, any of the golf course he goes to. So he's very excited for our setup and he's going to be helpful uh, as far as uh, when, when we actually put the chargers on the uh, shelving and uh, set, to set it up well, but uh, very exciting. I think they did a great job there. That's CES, the electrical contractor. The carts are still scheduled. Okay, the uh, chargers in place though? They're not, the chargers don't come until the golf carts come. The chargers actually come in the golf carts. Oh, I see. So the, the outlets are installed. Yeah, part of the package. Um, the carts are still scheduled for mid-October delivery, no change there. Uh, we're scheduling Wi-Fi installation in the cart barn. I, I mentioned before that, that that'll uh, allow us to put security cameras in the, in the building, but uh, more importantly for the carts, that'll allow them to get nightly updates um, to the GPS systems. And then uh, the temporary electric service was removed by Eversource, which is once again progress. Now our, our, our cart barn is operating on the new transformer and the new electric system. And no, no longer on the temporary system we were getting by on um, until they installed the, uh, made the final connection. And then we lined, we striped the parking lot. Uh, once the parking lot work was done, we, we, we did a restriping of the entire parking lot and the entrance road. And Roman, regarding the lining of the uh, parking lot and, uh, and what's been accomplished there, uh, I, common sense kind of tells me that we might have accrued or, or might have gained some spaces because of the organization that we yeah. have now? The, the, uh, the original plan we were scheduled to gain f f from the de demolishing of the old cart barn to where we are now, we were scheduled to gain 13 places. I think we lost one or two just when the engineer got in and, uh, and wanted to make sure that, that we fit the, the code on all the turn radiuses and such. So I, I believe we gained 12 parking places total oh, since, since the previous configuration. Yeah. Roman did. Did, did where we are? Did we ever consider giving any of those spaces to the hot stove? No, I, I mean I, I've spoken about that a lot here. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to because uh, the hot stove spots, as you'll see in the morning, they're they're pretty pretty in demand up by the clubhouse, but all the rest of the day they're empty, and those are our most prime spots. So I, I think. Um, you know, in respect to our customers, I, I would hate to see them uh, see empty places or or force them to break the rules yeah. because they they were the only spots available. So I, I think it should just be first come first serve for okay. those spots. And uh, folks, I had spoken to uh, Griff Ryder when he was here, uh, procurement slash engineer, man of many hats uh, within the town, and I. I'd like the committee's perspective because this is just one guy uh, and I feel as though I can be pretty objective. Uh, the rate of speed that people enter that ingress road is just, to me, unacceptable. Uh, the way people jockey through the uh, parking lot, uh, it's unacceptable. I would like to see, uh, like you see some places screened out in the McAdam, mm -hmm. you're in a five mile per hour zone. Yeah. Or portable speed bumps. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but I just see an accident waiting to happen there. I I have a list, Clem, of uh, new signage oh, that we're going to do. Great. I, I, great. I had yeah. planned on putting some five mile yeah. an hour oh, signage great. on on the on the driveway. You know what I think is really dangerous, Roman? What's that? Is the trucks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The amount. Of I've never seen so many pickup trucks. Well. And they stick out yeah. halfway. In the in the drive yeah. to your parking place, yeah. it's very it's, common problem at all golf courses. Every yeah. golf course with a restaurant. Sure. I mean, all, all everywhere I've worked, the delivery trucks are, are a problem, especially it's not when the no, delivery it's trucks. Not, it's the talking thing. about the oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about like pickup trucks. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, parking we, trucks. We you see those have, extended cab. Yeah, they, 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 if you get unluckily yeah. one of those, yeah. they're, they're big. big. You better have a long neck. We, yeah. we yeah. do have a tight parking lot. I mean, we, we definitely our, our parking lot is definitely yeah. tight. Yeah. You can't tell people that they can't come. With it. Maybe we could park them all down at the end. <laughs> hey, Roman, one quick question on the. Uh, so now we have 
No, that's the clubhouse. So that, that strictly goes uh, from the maintenance where the, where the pump house is up to the new car barn. That, that, that's the new line. So the maintenance barn and the car barn are all on the same line? Yeah. yeah. Now, how does that impact the solar farm? Are we uh, selling great energy from the solar farm? The solar farm, farm is active and, and we are creating credits. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think I so sent. A, money. I, we are. I sent an email. I think to the committee the, the day that we turned it on. Yeah. yeah that's well, awesome. So I'll continue here. Um, jockey pump repair. Again, I mentioned this at the last committee meeting. Um, the, the contract I put on here it was signed by the town administrator. I actually haven't seen the contract returned to me yet. Signed. Uh, it was sent to him on Friday, so I'm yeah. expecting that to be signed. How much uh, is that? Uh, that? That was for twenty-eight thousand dollars. To purchase this, the um, parts for the jockey pump repair, um, there will be a labor cost as well. Is that coming from our budget? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, we encumbered twenty-three thousand dollars from the previous fiscal year's budget, and uh, the remainder will come out of our, our current budget in the capital outlay line item. Um, and then the, the same contractor that, that will be doing that is is the gentleman that we've engaged to prepare an irrigation upgrade quote for us. So, you know, we, that, that's the, the number we really need to discuss our, our future irrigation upgrade. He's gonna prepare the quote once he's completed the, uh, the, the jockey pump repair. Roman, is the um, solar that is being, uh, being produced, the electric that is being produced, is that enough to offset the charging of the electric carts? Yeah, it's all theoretical at this point, but, but it, it should be. We're expecting it to be. Uh, they have this uh, the Schedule Z that the, the, the um, solar vendor uses, and what they do is they, they estimate how, what areas of our operation are going to need what for credits, and so they've estimated what they think we're going to need for uh, the, the golf cart charters, and then uh, they can update that Schedule Z report every six months. So we'll, we'll keep updating it to be as efficient as possible. Um, but uh, it, until, until we're actually charging the carts, I, I'm not sure. Uh, what the plan was going into, when we entered into this agreement was the solar uh, field we have would basically negate our electric bill, which is about 50 or $60,000 a year. The entire bill. Yeah. And uh, you know, prior Carol, you know, in the initial concept uh, of solar paneling the car barn itself, as it evolved with the standalone field, the combination of both has, has put us in that, that really good position. Uh, so, first right, let me keep cooking here. So, uh, the, I don't have any other information other than uh, at, at a um, earlier in the month at a Board of Selectmen's meeting, because I know we mentioned this at our meeting last month. Uh, the town administrator told the Board of Selectmen that he will present a plan in September for both the golf and harbor restaurant leases. So, uh, you know, I, I expect him to reach out to me before he does it, but th that's the plan. Because I know, Steve, you were mentioning uh, the timetable for releasing those. He uh, took it upon himself to bring that up to the Board of Selectmen saying, I'm going to come to you in September with a plan. Um, and then just a little housekeeping, I wanted to report back to the committee that the first tee will not be using the tee times that you approved for their final day. Uh, the, the, their instructor uh, feels that being the first session that he's had with, with this group of kids, they're not quite ready for the golf course. So he, he decided to turn back those tee times to us and have another uh, day on the range with them. They are gonna go one day further on the range than was originally scheduled because they had a rain date. So they're, they're gonna be meeting on August 25th, which is yeah. an extra date. Roman, yes. um, going back to the restaurant lease, yep. is he going to put golf and harbor together for one? I, he's exploring that idea. I haven't heard anything final on that. He, he mentioned that. At the Board of Selectmen meeting, he mentioned that to Clem and I last year that, that uh, he may, well, what I think he may do is when he releases them, he releases them independently, but, but they can also be combined. I, I, th I think he'll, he'll give options as far as that goes, where, where, where there may be an incentive to, to take both, but um, he wants to release them concurrently, so possibly somebody can consider doing both. 
Well, I haven't gotten any further detail. That was that was something he discussed yeah. last fall, and and, uh, and that was one of the reasons he wanted to do a one year lease currently with the hot stove because uh, he he wanted to marry them up together. And then um, on the excuse me, wrong no, 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 on the first key, yes. Um, is there anything we can do to to provide even more support? Does he need? Does the instructor need help? Volunteers, you know, just to help with the kids. I mean, is, I appreciate. Is, is, is staff a limiting factor for them? Because no, it, I think it, you'll find lots of people would be more than happy. Yeah, it's to, actually it's to, actually to we had, had a great turnout. I I reached out. Um, for volunteers, he hasn't needed any. And I think in the future, when the, because it's the first year, these kids aren't necessarily golf ready yet. Yep. And when they become golf ready, we're gonna try to have a, a Tuesday play night where I'd like to have volunteers go out just to be safety monitors with them. So I, I, I collected a, a, a group of volunteers and uh, we, we never needed them. But I think it's just because this was the first session for public. Uh, one thing I, I would mention is uh, we, ha we are receiving donations. So we've, we've received a, a couple sets of used clubs for the kids and four used uh, push cards. So I, I, I turned those over uh, to the uh, first tee director and he may use them with our program. He may take them and use them with one of his other programs if he thinks our kids can't use them. It is, we, we've had a number of uh, uh, people reach out though to, vol to volunteer and to donate, which wow. is nice. Very nice. If those are, if those are useful, the used clubs, it, it might be worthwhile to put on our website that to to the membership. We have, there's probably lots of us that have multiple sets of clubs we, in our basement collecting dust that if it could go to good use for young people, sure. I, I'm sure we'd be thrilled to do that. You know, I, I don't see the need, see, I think it's great. I don't see the need to do that. We've gotten about a half dozen sets every year that I've been at Cranberry Valley, and not necessarily for the first team, but just for the kids in general. Uh, we get a, a many sets that should go to the dump. They come to us, so they, it saves them the dump <laughs> trip. And you know, you wouldn't want to touch them because they're they're so moldy when when you get your hands on them. So yeah. I'm not I'm not interested in, in okay. getting more. Understood. But uh, and then you know, in a lot of cases, the uh, the uh, adult clubs aren't necessarily great for the younger kids. No. And I, I know a lot of us grew up playing clubs that were too long and heavy for us. These days. If the kids have the, the ways and means, we'd rather have them starting with junior clubs that are lighter and more appropriately um, built for them. Um, and then, uh, again, I just wanted to report to, to the uh, golf committee because this came up last month when we were discussing financials. Um, on the financial spreadsheet, I have a number of items uh, listed for um, the driving range in particular, some upgrades I think we should be doing to the driving range. I had on there that, that I'd like to do some of the netting and some of the upgrades through the Pro Shop Revolving right. Fund. Uh, the town, I, I talked to our finance director and then she talked to the town administrator. He determined that the driving range is not an appropriate use of the revolving fund for expenditure. I agree with him with that, looking back on, on the language of the setup of that account. What, what I'm uh, gonna do and suggest with the committee is, is we have an article at town meeting that will address that to say, um, to, to allow our pro shop revolving fund to ex expend uh, um, for the driving range needs. Uh, so currently we can't, but I think that'll solve a lot of the needs for equipment and upgrades at the driving range if we do an article, uh, to, then we'll address that and our finance director uh, supported that idea. Um, we'll see if there should be any parameters on it. My justification was basically uh, our, our instructor, uh, his license fee is five to six thousand dollars per year. I'd like to see that at the very minimum reinvested in the driving range. Um, so we'll see. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to support a, uh, a article at town meeting to allow expenditure from the pro shop development fund for the for driving range needs. And is that, then is that where his fee goes? His fee does go to the revolving fund. Yeah. And then uh, last but not least, hole number six. I know we, I've talked to the committee for years about this, that there's a gentleman there that's not happy with golf balls and people on his property. Uh, I met with uh, the chairman of the board of selectmen on site. We, I, I, I walked the site with him. I uh, discussed with the town council uh, the history of this situation. And, uh, and the result was the board of selectmen voted unanimously to deny this neighbor's request for us to put up a net to protect his property. The feeling of the town is the golf uh, department has 
done all the appropriate steps. We've put a chain link fence to stop uh, pedestrian put people from going on this property, and we've planted Leland cypresses, uh, which grow three to five feet per year, to help wall off his property. So uh, the, the feeling was we've done enough. So uh, I, I was I was happy to see that the board of selectmen supported what we've done there because we didn't want to set a precedent of uh, of uh, putting up nets along the property. I think that's uh, greatly appreciated because any precedent that would have been set by continuing that particular venture, I think would be a disservice to you know, anyone that's an abutter, landowner, you know, sharing space with the golf course. So I think so too. Kudos. And there was a feeling that if we continued to do more for him, uh, by the town council felt like that, that would be admission of a, of a, a problem. Exactly. And, and he, he felt like there was no need to admit a problem. If anything, I think in this particular situation, this pro property owner has done a lot of clearing of his uh, on his own yeah. land where he had a nice natural barrier of trees that he cleared that really opened his property up to some golf balls. And we've, by planting the Leland Cypresses and putting up the fence, we've, we've helped to close that, that uh, gap that he opened. This is hard to capture in a picture, but uh, this is a photo of the uh, charger grid. You can see the shelving right here with the outlets on it. Um, there are 20 of those in the car barn to, to accommodate our, our new fleet, but um, um, maybe not impressive on photo. I, I'd yeah. encourage anybody when you're at the golf course, feel free to do a walk through the car I, barn and take a look. I took a couple of pictures myself, Roman. It's just not very photogenic. It's so I low mean, profile. It it's, it's very it low profile. It is. It, a quick question. Uh, with the evolution of on the maintenance side of uh, hybrid vehicles and so on, uh, I know with with a fleet of 80 carts, we don't have really any generous available extra space, do we? In the we, barn. we do uh, because the barn, we, we, we um, followed the dimensions for the barn that would house 96 cars. Yeah, so our, our, our barn was designed for 96. Yeah, so the back end of it has, has yeah, space for, really for doing some. Because uh, I, I was just thinking that if Sean got some experimental equipment, you know what I mean, that hy was hybrid specific, we got a great environment, you know? Well, we're planning on using it for, you know, I mean, you can appreciate this, storing the picker in the winter, things like that, that, that normally would be outside and get wear and tear, right, so. Roman, you may not know this, but yep. but with the carts that are coming and the, and the chargers that are coming in them, the tractable cable? No, so I, 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 did, um, I did some research on that. Uh, there is a golf course that did that, and what happened was um, they, uh, um, had a warranty issue, but because what they had to do was cut the cable to feed it through. So uh, what, what our, our cart uh, salesperson and his cart rep uh, said that they lost their um, yeah. protection there. Yeah. They lost their protection there. So uh, we've got a good plan, Steve. What's gonna happen is, as you look at, um, under the shelving, under the shelving is gonna be the walkway, and we're gonna set up the chargers so that, that there's gonna be two on each side here, uh, facing either way because when you when you look at the charges the charger will tell you if it functioned properly or what degree the card is charged and then uh, the hooks will be hung just under the um, each either side of the shelf that will uh, will coil and hang the, the, the charger cords which is very standard but I did pursue the, the retractable what, what their idea was they basically said in the future this may be standard Right now, it's not, and, and the one golf course that's done it uh, hurt their warranty by doing it. Sure, if you had to cut the cable off, um, So we uh, we had our uh, club championship. So I just wanted to recognize our club champions. Women's champion was Florida, Flora Marie Gaudet, that um, shot in 89-82, and I believe we had 12 women participate, which was fantastic. And then uh, the men's champion was Sam Russell who shot 73-72 and uh, won it on the, um, on the uh, first playoff hole. We, we, we had a playoff. Um, moving on to the Dennis Walters show. Uh, that's a really exciting event where we're gonna have a, a PGA Hall of Famer come to the golf course and uh, do his show, which is a trick shot clinic basically, yeah. very inspirational. He showed up, and the day he showed up, it, it, was so, it was so awful. We had this one band of thunderstorms that was not predicted that, that hit 
the moment he was supposed to put on the show. So we made a decision. He's he's going on a tour through Boston and Maine. He's going to come back just to just to do our show, a makeup date. So Sunday, August twenty second at eleven a.m. We'd love to see as many people as possible. This is a free event. He normally charges twenty five hundred dollars per show, but Titleist is picking up the the, the bill for him uh, doing the show at Cranberry Valley. So uh, I uh, he he. And that's this Sunday. He's, yeah, he's yes, paralyzed. he's paralyzed. I do that. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot. It's a, it's such a fun show. There's a lot of dogs involved. He uses he uses rescue dogs to see the ball up for him. It's a wonderful story. His uh, his uh, documentary that just came out this this year was uh, um, narrated by Jim Nance, and the, the story is get a new dream, and that that's really the story of his of his show. Is uh, he had a dream to be a PGA Tour golfer. He was involved in an accident, left him paralyzed, and he got a new dream and, and since has become a PGA Hall of Famer by inspiring uh, the golfers. Are you going to put out a blast on the website? I've done, I've done a lot of it. I, I've contacted the Cape Cod Times, Cape Cod Chronicle, our website. Uh, all of our uh, annual pass holders have received notice. So we're ho I, I told him I was hoping to get 100 people at the event. He said he wants 200. He wants a, a crowd. So we're going to do our best to get as many as we can. It's, Whenever you do a reschedule, you always uh, take a hit, yeah. especially because uh, we, we had hyped this up for all of our families, and a lot of the families are leaving the Cape. So yeah. it's a great show for the kids. We're going to do our best to get as many people as possible, but I encourage anybody to go because it's a wonderful show. And then this may go in lines with um, what the letter that you referenced, Clem, but I just wanted to follow up with the committee because we were talking about stroke allocation and, uh, and that when the new fiscal year came, we would uh, print new scorecards with the new stroke allocation following uh, the uh, USGA and um, World Handicap System's new way of, of doing that. So this is the new stroke scorecard that represents the new stroke goals. So I just wanted to follow up with the committee. That, that Roman, did, did you say those are based on actual data? Based on the course rating, yes. No, the, the allocations. Is, the, is it based on the score achieved on that hole? Yeah. Because some of them, I mean, honestly, don't make sense. But I, I, I'll live with it. But yeah. It, so it, you know, I, well, I can provide you with, um, with with more of the criteria how they do it. It's based on a difficulty rating, and the difficulty rating takes a scratch golfer group and a bogey golfer group right. and looks at the differential. But actual scores. No, this this was done completely based on the course rating. Oh. Where when they do the course rating, they assign okay. a uh, a. Um, a uh, difficulty value to each hole. And the, the one thing that I really like about this, and I know, you know, golfers don't like change. And, and this, this is a much better way to do it because what happens is this will change concur concurrently with the course rating. So anytime the course is re-rated, the, the stroke allocation will be re-rated as well, re-established, instead of uh, those two things used to happen independently. And uh, and you know, I, I've had since we've put out the cards. You can imagine, I, I've I've had a lot of conversations with people that that understand the previous system and don't understand the, the new system. Uh, one of the th facts of this is uh, the USGA looks at it like it's in, imperfect, and what they want to do is spread the strokes out. So when what they do is they take the difficulty rating of the hole that, that was assigned by the raiders, and they uh, then uh, so that that's how they stack the, the holes. From there, they, they stack it uh, odd on the front, even on the back, so, so that separates it out. And then from there, they, they do a third thing where they separate it into triads, where they want to spread it out so you have a, a low number, a me medium number, and a high number, uh, each three holes. The basic idea is that if you and I had a match and you were giving me three strokes, they wouldn't fall right in a row. They, they would get spread out. Yeah, just, but just as an observation, all the par threes are higher rated than the par fives. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the system. I, I just leave it at that. I think I think there's an adjustment period. Um, this is the new system that when, when we when we um, when the USGA adopted the new World Handicap system, they said we're going to come out with a new way of doing stroke allocation. And the following year, they did. And so, but the one thing I say is we're one of the first golf courses to do this. And I I, th I think it, it's you know a good strength of our operation that we're. Um, on the forefront of following USGA and World Handicap System guidance. Well, one comment I've heard from many women is it seems unimaginable that 
the second hardest hole became the second easiest hole. From the red tee? Yes. So what are we looking at here? Uh, so 16, I think. Well, uh, the, so the, the big difference there that we always face is, is uh, 16 plays as a par 5 for the women. And, and so the, you, that, that's the number two hole for the men. One thing that I, I would say in general when you look at this stuff is, I know this gets very, very theoretical, but it's not the hardest hole. I mean, when, you, when you're looking at the, the world of golf calls it, is, it the hardest it, hole. It went from one, maybe one extreme to the other. Yeah. It just seems shocking. So what, what I would say there is, I, you know, the previous system of doing it, what was uh, um, you'd collect 500 scorecards and you would actually analyze the data of what people actually shot in this scratch group and in this bogey group. And so you're gonna see a very different uh, set of results when the system changes so drastically that now you're not looking at actual scores that Cranberry Valley golfers shot. You're looking at data derived from the uh, rating of the golf course. You know, in those cases, and I, I did it here for us just as an exercise, what we ended up with for the women, what, which is what the USGA cited when they put this data out and why they changed this was um, most golf courses have a very small uh, uh, segment when, you, when you're trying to look at a, a scratch group of golfers and they usually, I think, that they, they define that as a zero to six handicap. We were basically looking at Marge Mello. I mean, Mar Marge was our one golfer in the scratch group, so we'd have to expand the scratch group a little wider to get more people in it, so you'd actually have a representative group the old way. And then, and uh, that's what the USGA cited. They said that um, the previous system really wasn't working well because uh, you, you didn't get good representation in these, and, and, and that's what the, it's based on, is the differential between the scratch group of golfers and the bogey group of golfers, where you would need a, uh, basically a bogey golfer would need a stroke from a scratch golfer. Roman, one, yes. uh, one, one piece of feedback I got was, and it may just, it's probably just the timing thing, but some of the, some of the, the, the hole ratings change and right after the change, the silver tees and white tees were together. Even though the change was made with the yardage from the silver tees being significantly shorter than the white tees. And people were saying, now wait a minute. <laughs> you took a stroke away from me on this, and yet I'm not getting the advantage of, of a shorter hole. So, and, I, and it's my understanding that Sean does the two tees together for maintenance purposes on the tee box. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's for um, maintenance control, so we yeah. can control the different areas. But it might have been nice if we waited a few weeks at yeah. least so that when people saw the change, they go, okay, at least I understand it I, now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see whenever we do stuff like this, the, the people fight change. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, I, 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 I was sure to go through USGA and Mass Golf uh, every step of the way in this. and, and and this is a good system. This is the official system. We don't need to worry about when it was conducted if, you know, yeah. we, we didn't have enough golfers, like I said, in that scratch group sure. of golfers. It, this is strictly by the rating. It'll change when the rating changes next. Um, I think that, you know, uh, golfers' mentality is, again, stuck in what's the hardest hole and why is this not the hardest hole anymore, and it's really got nothing to do with it. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's a new system. <laughs> Do, do we have a rating and slope rating for the women on silver and white? Yes, we do. How do you how do we find out what that is? Um, so um, we don't publish that because it's so rare that, that people play that. If if a golfer wanted to, if if a woman golfer wanted to play the white tees they could post to that on gin. Uh, that, that's an available uh, tee for them to post to their score. It's not appropriate for us to post on, uh, to put on the scorecard because it's such a rare situation. But uh, it ju for just the same, we, we have uh, ratings from the red tees for men. Uh, when, when Mass Golf comes in and rates the golf course, they rate the, the entire golf course from all tee right. sets. Right, we have juniors coming up that are long ball hitters. Sure. So playing from silver, playing from a white would be nice too. 
at least know what that rating was. Okay, so they, 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 that won't be on the scorecard, but they can post their score to it. And when they, when they go log on to GIN, they will see the rating when they post their score. Well, if they played the white team, would it be just the index from the white teams? Well, women would have a, um, so we, be a well, different we don't have the rating listed from the white tees. There's a separate women woman rating for white tees. But actually, they play the men's white tee, right? Yeah. So how would that differ? Uh, the the um, it's a it's a different course rating for women from from the, the whites. The ge genders have different ratings for T group. I think you sent out all. I don't know whether everyone got it, but I think you sent out all those ratings. Um, I did. I did. And you know when I um, as I sent out in the last email I sent out to the annual pass holders, I worked with the um, men's and women's association to get their leadership. You know, Ellen and, and yourself. I, I sent all the information to really um, try to um, have some education on what we were doing with that. Speaking of gin, uh, too, as everybody knows, I'm sure, but it's surprising how many people don't know, that new USGA free app that shows the golf course, that GPS system, it's, it's fantastic. It's as good as, I mean, people have been paying pretty good money for some of those apps. I, I found it very, very user friendly. I don't know, have you had a chance to use it or utilize it? My game's it? not that precise, but I, I, know, <laughs> I know it's there. I saw it on there and I it's, said, it's I'm great. not going there yet. <laughs> uh, so um, I sent out everybody the financial sheet. I, you right. know, once again, this is uh, the first month of the fiscal year. What I would point out as a few items of interest to me was, um, you know, last year was historic, and, and in, as far as greens fees and car fees, we're actually uh, performing ahead of last year. Um, when you look at annual passes, we were well down, and uh, what, the one reason that I would mention this is, is uh, the a annual pass sales came in late last year based on all the restrictions. A lot of people didn't buy them until we, we reached phase right. three, and we reached phase three until on July 6th last year. So what I expect is, uh, because of that, that really positively affected last year's annual pass numbers. I, I'd expect there to be a correction this year just because um, last year saw late purchases where, where, where I think we're returning more to normal. And, um, and you see that with the range pass sales last, last year. We had $2,500 in range passes in July, which is awful late to purchase a, a range pass. Um, but, uh, the, and then one thing I want to point out too, I changed... At the bottom of the screen, I changed uh, how I was going to list the annual pass sales because uh, I really want, I, I thought that that shouldn't follow fiscal year. It should follow you know, how many active annual passes we currently have. So this is the active number. It, that does not necessarily uh, coordinate with the um, uh, annual pass sales at the top. The, the, that's just a number to show how many active annual passes there are. And so I'll, I'll do that on a calendar year basis so that people get a good sense of how many are active at the time. Um, but once again, you, you'll notice some other numbers. We have really high rounds, but not as high as last year, which shows that you know the the the, um, the T sheet was full more on the back end. So we're full every day this time of year, except maybe the last hour or so. So uh, that that just shows how incredible that demand was last year and how we are returning to normal levels, although still very high demand. I mean, your, your salaries and wages are significantly down. Yep. That, Is that because of your budget constraints? No, that's not. We, we, we're we're uh, very similar on salary and wage. When you see a disparity like that, Jack, that's just um, where uh, one month had five payrolls and the one we're comparing it to had four, just based on the day, how, where the days of the week fell. You'll see that pretty regularly, how, how uh, that goes. But uh, we're very similar on salary and wage. Roman, do you know on the, the uh, 2020 year to date, number of rounds? Yep. Uh, the 19.455, how does that compare to like 2019 or 2018? Or a typical long tornado on COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Golf course is closed here. I would say that'd be low. I'd be just because, so, so 2020, 2020, we were completely closed in April, um, very restricted in May, restricted in June. So I would say, uh, you know, uh, the, the numbers we used to um, average were around forty-three to 45000 annually. The, this past fiscal year, we were 55000 so we were 10000 over for the fiscal year. Um, the the uh, uh, fiscal year 
2020 was uh, very low because it started with the tornado and then went into the, so that, that was it. You know, it's actually very convenient that those two events fell in the same, the same fiscal year. year. No, yeah. Not the same calendar, but it's very convenient that we yeah. can just say that is the, the aberration of the anomaly. Yeah. Um, and then if there's no more questions on that, I, I just wanted to follow up. So I mean, there were questions last meeting about the, um, miscellaneous, mis yeah. the uh, general fund miscellaneous. So I just did a, a pull the report on this. And the reason I didn't remember, it's a very niche uh, num uh, item that's in there. The, the, these $44 and $22 uh, charges of $49, uh, the only thing that gets charged to that account regularly is credit card finance fees on annual pass sales. So that it's a very niche number. Um, the town requires us when we sell an annual pass to charge the uh, convenience the convenience fee. So uh, that goes into that miscellaneous number. The two strange numbers here, the 1100, that's just a number that was uh, mistakenly put in that account and then very following day came out. That was Ron's rent check based for the month. And it was mistakenly put in there, it came right out. The, the one number that happens annually there is the, um, that happened on the last day of the fiscal year. That does not happen in our office. That, that's our finance director, Carol Coppola, um, um, taking the monies for, that were in a um, liability account for credit uh, for uh, gift certificates and credit books and, and uh, show, displaying the liability there. So um, what happens is when we sell items on a uh, credit book, the, when the tender occurs, that's when the credit book hits our, our books. But when like, say sweeps, when, when on an average Wednesday when sweeps purchases $300 of credit book, it goes into this liability account uh, awaiting the sale to occur. So that's just the representation of that, li uh, of that liability. And um, sorry, it took so long. I meant to cruise through that in 10 minutes. But uh, with that, I'm done. Okay. Uh. Oh, Clem, I'm sorry. I did jot down two more things I wanted to mention yep. real fast. Uh, I've been called to a department head meeting tomorrow. The, 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 um, the meeting is called emergency response. I, would not, I, I have no idea what the meeting is. I would not be shocked if it turns out it's going to be a mask mandate for town buildings. I, I really get the sense that's what, we're, we're, that's what the meeting's all about. So I'll, I'll reach out tomorrow. Um, if with with news, but I'm expecting uh, a change like a mask mandate, and, we'll, and I'll let you know if it, it's going to affect uh, committee meetings as well. And then uh, I just want to also mention on Channel 18, I, I did a presentation um, for the non-resident taxpayers meeting. They asked me to go and do a golf department uh, presentation, wow. so I was recorded, and that's showing on Channel 18. It'll show the board of selectmen, so keep an eye out for that. That's great, and that's that. Uh, <clears throat> any questions? I, had a, I just had a couple of simple things. Roman, you mentioned the interns, and I think having interns uh, in-house is just tremendous. Uh, and, and I think you people that are uh, at the club all the time, I, I, I'm sure you have the same kind of observation. I'm going back a year plus before the COVID. The assistance that Dick Fagan got and uh, the staff got, and I, I would throw this out, uh, Ellen, to you know both the men's and women's group. I mentioned it before. The big issue, I believe, is housing. Yes, Correct. It and, is. And uh, you know that might be something to embrace as far as you know advertising or promoting the idea that if we had golf interns, you know, that it might be appropriate, you know, for someone to step up and not that everything is. A, and it doesn't necessarily have to be free, but uh, you know, it might be economically something that would be attractive to someone. Uh, it's the biggest impediment to yeah. take. Yeah. We, we had a number of applicants that wanted to be interns, and they, they applied to a number of golf, golf courses, and then they see who's got the best deal. Yeah. And when they look at coming to the Cape and having to pay rent, our, our, our last uh, golf professional uh, um, intern was a young lady named Mackenzie. And she, she went was, through a she lot of trouble. Great. She was a great yeah. kid, uh, went through a lot of trouble with housing. Um, again, I don't think that, that the town should get involved in, in the housing side because there's a lot of liability there. Um, but um, Well, that could be through the private sector. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the other conundrum, I mean, people 
traffic on the Cape has just gone from bad to worse. And, you know, it'd be easy to push back and say, well, they could commute. But, uh, you know, with the young people I interact with at uh, Cape Cod National in terms of caddies and so on, I don't know how they do it. I mean, some of these kids drive in from off Cape. The horror stories are profound as far as traffic and congestion, you know, trying to be on time. So I think that's, uh, you know, there's certainly a degree of difficulty. So my one big... Uh, How many interns do you have a year? One or two? One. We, 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 what we were looking for is uh, one... Um, well, when I reach out to the colleges that have golf professional training programs, um, they, they, they consider them level one, two, or three interns, and a level three intern would be what you would consider a first assistant pro. Uh, they would be more of an extended season. You would have them for about seven months a year, so that they'd even like get in, yeah. into part of their school year. I, I advertise for we would take either a one, two, or a three. We'd, we'd take any of them. And, uh, you know, if we had uh, two applicants, one of them was the level three level and one was level one level, we would take them both because we, we'd put a level one a person in our starter shed doing check-in and working in the car barn and doing basic stuff, whereas a level two or three intern would help Dick Fagan, which is what we need, uh, using Golf Genius and, and uh, doing scoring for events. And one last comment I was going to make regarding the range and the range operation. I mean, you know, when the committee considers the tremendous increase of volume of uh, sales and revenue generated there, I mean, I, th I think that Warren article is uh, absolutely imperative. I think so too. And uh, what what would happen is if we could operate, uh, this is one one of the reasons the, the town um, and may not support it, and town meeting may not support it. They don't like very open ended uh, revolving funds. It would give us tremendous flexibility. Yeah. Where currently, when we do projects out of the uh, pr uh, out of the golf improvement fund. That, that money all has to go to town meeting. It, it can only be assigned at town meeting. Right. Whereas out of the revolving fund, we could we could do it as needed, and yeah. and it, it would it would you know we'd be required obviously to follow uh, state procurement law, but we would not need to have anything on the capital plan. It would allow for a lot more flexibility uh, as far as you know uh, addressing needs uh, as far as the netting goes, um, the the, sh the shed, the actual machines, uh, the the tee box. So. Yeah, because I. It offer a lot of flexibility. There's a, there are a lot of initiatives that really have to be, or issues that have to be addressed. Yeah. You know, you've outlined a lot of them, and uh, you know everybody has the same opportunity. Uh, Roman, I'll make Roman smile, but uh, on my own, I was just curious because I had talked to Bob Miller about uh, a, an all-season teaching station, the possibility of it financially does it make sense and so on, and. Uh, I found a company called Dry Range, not that they're the only uh, player in town, but uh, it was interesting because I thought the committee would be interested in the, uh, you know, it's always about the dollar, dollar amount. There were a variety of uh, awnings and covers, if you will, and uh, they range uh, uh, anywhere from ten to about $15,000, which isn't, I don't think, huge money. The, the one uh, teaching station that I liked was a self-contained, hurricane-proof structure, uh, basically a glorified uh, steel building, if you will, specific to golf instruction. And uh, that, I, I kind of twisted his arm. He, I'm, I'm awaiting further information. Uh, he said that, he, that I would be obligated to sign off on an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement to get the specifics because, you know, what he was alluding to was I get their design, we build it ourselves and save maybe 20,000 bucks. So I said, hey, I said, if, if you can share that, the depth of that information, I said, uh, I'd, I'd be more than glad to sign off on it. So uh, it's interesting stuff. But, uh, you know, Bob Miller also simultaneously is working on the same thing. Uh, Jeez, folks. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure, Carol. Um, where does the revenue come from that goes into the golf revolving fund? So the, 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 that's yeah. uh, we call that the pro shop revolving yeah. fund, and that's that's a pro shop sales, um, lesson uh, revenue, uh, and restaurant rent. And 
And so so it'd, be, it'd be less in revenue, which includes Bob Miller's rent check, uh, rent from the restaurant, pro shop sales, yeah. and, uh, and um, also... So pretty much all the items that are under expenses are also income coming from those things as well. No, it's revenue. Um, I mean, not funny. Well, you so you're looking on the financial spreadsheet? Yes. Yep. Yes. So, um, yes, absolutely. So, so the revenue from the sale of those go into the Pro Shop Revolving Fund. Okay. Uh, pursuant to the agenda, uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, the old business. Uh, basically, uh, uh, since Joan wasn't here uh, in the last meeting, uh, we had kind of quasi-tabled it. Uh, John, if you would, the strategic plan updates uh, as you have shared with us, and uh, if you'd like to uh, address that, thank you. Well, I mean, uh, does everybody have a copy of that? Yeah. It's just right here? That's it? Right. Uh, I think the last time we had two uh, elements that were up for discussion. Number one, the vision statement. And then also there was a lot of discussion over the goals and priorities that we had established as the golf committee. So uh, my one quick comment on the vision statement is personally, I thought that was quite redundant when you consider the vision statement versus what the mission statement was. And I, I just thought that the vision statement had to be much more specific in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Number two, was the goals and the priorities. And I think there was a lot of discussion saying that, well, we weren't involved in the uh, discussion or the input in terms of what the goals and priorities were for the year. And I have to beg differently on that, only because, I mean, that's basically the conversation that we have during the course of the entire year in terms of what developing our priorities are. And the priorities I'm talking about uh, the ones that we use as the blueprint for Roman in terms of identifying what projects that we want to uh, establish for the year, whether it be from the Golf Improvement Fund, the Pro Shop Revolving Fund, or the Infrastructure Fund, as well as the budget. So there's a lot of projects that we have planned throughout the year, but they're identified under each one of the uh, different budgets that we have in the Golf Committee. And uh, so, the only reason, and I made this comment on the strategic plan, was that this is just a reference point. The actual detail is involved in the priorities, which is our blueprint that we change every year based on all the discussions that Roman has with capital outlays and, and the uh, town administrator. And I was just trying to identify on this back here, in terms of the short-term and the long-term projects, the projects that we identified in a generic point of view in terms of what we're trying to work on. So if anybody from the town took a look at us and said, okay, what do you guys do? I mean, what, do you, what are some of the things that you're working on? Short term, Here these are some of the things that we're trying to work on to make Cranberry Valley one of the premier golf courses from a municipal point of view. And long range, these are some of the things that we're working on, once again, to try to make it a very good premier golf course. So I don't think there's anything on that sheet that we have not discussed over the last year, or over the last five years, actually. Five uh, plus years. So that, that was my only comment in terms of the strategic plan. I, and I think the other reason that we need a strategic plan is that all of us are not gonna be on this committee forever. And if it, we all get hit by a bus tomorrow, at least somebody coming in here would have a direction of saying, okay, this is, this is our mission statement. These are the guiding principles that we have in terms of how we do rates and fees and the funds and policy development. And these are some of the goals and priorities that we're working on, right? So, I mean, at least they have an over, overview or a concept of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so that's my only comment on the strategic plan. And, uh, you know, I think we need one. I really do. I mean, we do a lot of good things in this committee. Yeah. And I think it should be uh, kind of put in black and white. And also it provides a document to us then to update it as we go year to year. Exactly. If there's things that we don't like. 
Uh, the only other comment I had on the vision statement was that uh, I know we spent a lot of time going back and forth on the vision statement, but I think we got bogged down in terms of trying to make, make it grammatically correct. Or, and I, I, I just think that when you take a look at the vision statement versus the mission statement, they're very, they're very similar. And I was just, that's why I think I provided you, Clement, I think you set it out as well. It's just a uh, rough draft of a, another vision statement in terms of some of the things that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I take a look at, and this is just my own perspective, but to me, when I take a look at Granbury Valley, what we're trying to do as a golf committee, uh, we're always trying to put emphasis on funds and how do we make Granbury Valley a better golf course, as well as the infrastructure that we have here at Granbury Valley. Number two, and I think Steve has brought this up numerous times as well, we want to be financially responsible in how we operate Frederick Valley and be of any assistance that we can to Roman in developing whatever we have to develop to make Frederick Valley move on. Now, the other thing that we've talked a lot about <coughs> was to address the junior golf programs. And I think we've made great progress in that when you consider uh, we've got First Tee, we've got Youth on Course, we've got the New England Junior Golf Program. Uh, we've got a, a great potential to work in the future with Monomai High School. Because yeah. quite frankly, Monomai High School is not where it should be in terms of golf development. When you compare it to other high schools in the area, we're certainly behind yeah. in that area. I really agree. And I think by putting a lot of emphasis on Junior Golf, at least we can make the effort to improve the kids in the town of Howlich. You get involved in this. I mean, there's got to be an opportunity there. <laughs> lastly, uh, to provide superior customer service. I think that's one of the things that we're always striving for. So, I mean, I, I was just trying to take a look at, when you take a bit, uh, look at a vision, what are we trying to do at the end of the day? And uh, I think those, are, to me, that those are some of the things that we work on during the course of the year. And that's my comment. To take charge. Okay. Uh, uh, well, Carol, I don't know who go ahead. I, I think that that vision statement is a little bit too specific. And I think it's generally a vision statement is one or two short sentences that are easily memorized. It's like um, I have a couple. Google is to provide access to the world's information in just one click. That's a vision statement. It's easily memorized. It's not specific in terms of building a three-hole course. That mm -hmm. may come underneath your goals and priorities to get to your vision statement. But I, so I think it's a little bit too long, John, in my opinion. And too specific. I think, yeah. I think the vision statement should be short. And sweet. And it's something that the mission statement is what we have and what we're working on. The vision is what we see down the road three to five years. And three to five years, we'd love to see, say, um, a practice area that would meet all age groups, particularly our junior golfers. Mm -hmm. So that in three years, when they drive up to Cranberry Valley, they see those things that we're doing for junior golf. I think the things that you have done, John, and you've put a lot of work into this, is our strategic plan, our short-term goals and our long-term goals. But I don't think it's part of our vision. That's all. And our, our vision could be as simple as to be the top rated municipal golf course on Cape Cod, delivering total golf experience to residents and visitors yeah. alike. I mean, it could be that simple. Yeah. But I think we're, we're going into much more detail with yeah. Folks, I think thoughts? what I'd like to see uh, from my perspective as chair is because the vision statement is a Pandora's box of sorts if we pulled that out, uh, 
you know, in an interim, ba a temporary basis, and uh, you know, looked at that, you know, further for further exploration. Uh, as the strategic plan is uh, stated, including the mission uh, statement and all of the other uh, information that John supplied, I, I'd entertain a motion to uh, accept it as uh, John has outlined for us and pull that vision statement out to work on, you know, to, to everybody's satisfaction. Mm -hmm. oh, I think we should get feedback from the young people. I mean, I know, you, Steve, you were... Oh, I didn't... Yeah. I wasn't yeah. trying I mean, to... To be frank, I'm not all I'm not all that concerned about the vision statement. Really yeah. not. They, yeah. they, they they're a nice little plaques on the wall, but no what, what, is, what does it mean in your day to day life and what you're going to do? Well, that's why the strategic I, plan I think is critically important. Yeah. Right. right. And it's been developed over time, and it's got a long range. But I, I I've yet to see us have a 30 minute discussion across all the committee members about what what the priority should be. I mean, what. Simple little example. It's not on the list. It says it's not on the priority list. Permanent bathrooms. Why isn't it on the perm why isn't it on the list? I've never I've been on the committee for three years now, two and a half years. I've not once heard a discussion at a committee meeting about whether or not I mean, and, it may, and maybe we have had them and I apologize if I missed it, but it's that sort of back and forth, everybody expressing an opinion. That we should co we should collectively come to some sort of agreement on what those priorities should be. Just because it was written five years ago or eight years ago or went out five to ten years doesn't mean those priorities shouldn't be changed. shouldn't be open to discussion and potential change. I don't know. And 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 to me, those are really critical things. What is the priority of of what we're going to do when, based on the funding that we can obtain? Well. I have a comment to that. I mean, every meeting we have the opportunity to bring up anything that we want to discuss, whether it be a, a goal or a priority or things that we should be working on. And I think it just takes the initiative of the person to follow through on that project. I mean, if, if it's not on, the, on our priority list, I mean, we've got to work on it to get it on. If we feel it collectively as a group, that's a top priority. However, when, you, when you're dealing with a golf course, yeah. you can't have 22 priorities. Yeah, absolutely. You got to have you got to narrow it down to three, four, five, whatever the case may be, or whatever our budget for, it all uh, comes for enables to budget. us to do. Yeah. And uh, if I was to take a look at some of the priorities that we have, but that probably didn't fall in the top five. Right. In one, terms thing, of us getting, I, also, one thing I'd mentioned, John, like you were saying, is I, I think we used to have more discussion about it uh, because. We, very recently, we came to the idea that, and I remember the committee was unanimous on this, that the, the main priority was the irrigation system, and that was going to take years to accumulate funds for. So I think we're, we're in the accumulating funds phase towards what the committee decided unanimously was the priority. And so there's not a lot, you know, while we're accumulating those funds towards that project, there's not a lot of uh, excess funding until, until that, 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 that gets dedicated, until the job gets done and the debt's dedicated and then we know what we have to spend elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, Paul. I think that's particularly true with the, the big investments that we had. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can try to piecemeal together and do, do through the Gallup Cooper budget or right. the budget itself right. or whatever the case may be. But I mean, you're right. The, the big project that we have as a committee is the irrigation system. Yeah, because I think annually we used to have more discussion, but one, and, and I, I think it was two years ago, that the committee unanimously decided that that was the priority. And since then, you know, on the spreadsheet, that just took, that goes right down for the Golf Improvement Fund, that, that money's dedicated. And as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're waiting for the um, quote on that, but it's probably going to be around a million dollars, and then we'll find out what the debt schedule is, and we'll find out what extra funds are. But I think one, once that became the priority and that hit the books, that, that's taken up a bunch of years of our funding uh, for projects. Uh, Paul? A couple of thoughts. Number one, I think the list of short-term and long-term priorities are critical, and, and they are part of the strategic plan, and they ought to, they ought to be our focus. And, and the explanation for how we got to this point, um, you know, and, and there can be, Steve, there can be add-ons from year to year, something that comes yeah. up that's important. Um, but I'm very comfortable with 
what John has done in kind of um, reminding us of what they are. Um, and on the vision statement, um, I feel kind of badly because a prior member did an awful lot of work and I tried know. to encourage us to all participate. Yep. And he gave us an opportunity to yep. weigh in. And, yep. and, and we each wrote a redraft and so forth. And maybe we got a little too and Maybe too many cooks spoil the stew. I don't know. But um, you know, I don't want to be dismissive about it. I mean, I think you need a vision statement. And, right. and if there's a short, concise way we can do it, I'm for it. Um, and I, so I think it needs further work. I agree yeah, with needs, that. It needs further work. It doesn't need further work. Yeah. And then, but I think we ought to acknowledge that you know, these are all critical things. Irrigation, I mean, when I went on the yeah. visit last year for our, you know, what is it, every two USGA, years? USGA, yeah. Visit with USGA. I mean, it was clear, you know, Sean was, and, and his staff were trying to bend over backwards to take care of our irrigation, but we desperately need to invest in it. It ought to be a top priority. I mean, it's really what makes the course what yeah. it is. Yeah. And um, so but, you know, we need to keep that in the line. But, I'll, but all I'm saying is I, I agree with you in, in sense, but it, with that being the top priority, are any of the other short-term events likely to even occur? You know, if that's the top priority and, and we need, you know, I, I think if you go to the town meeting, just my personal opinion, and ask for a million dollars, you're going to get voted down unless you can fund yep. it some way on your own. Look, at right. the, look what happened on Lower County Road. That got knocked out right out of the, the budget. So I think unless, if that's our top priority, then can you piecemeal that project? And I, I We'd be using our funding so mechanisms. Th that, that, that is the plan with this, um, is that we're, saved, we're building a balance. Yeah. And then once we get um, the uh, quote, I'm going to go to the town's finance director and get a debt schedule, just like we did for the car farm project. And so when it does go to a town meeting, it will, be, it will say at the bottom, funded by golf department. So I, I think that's the only way it gets done. Yes. I think any project we do, should, should we, we need to have the funding Funded. as well. And we're about to pay off some obligations in a really short Absolutely. period of time. Exactly. Absolutely. So that will loosen up our flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you Absolutely. take a look at it, the development of the funds that we've done over the last six or seven years, between the golf improvement budget and the infrastructure fund, if we didn't have those, we'd be no. Do we would have the, the, irrigation, of the irrigation system would be daunting because we, if we had no funding yeah. source for yeah. it. Yeah. We've done a lot of things yeah. over the last years to make this golf course a lot better. Yeah. And uh, I think that's that's the excitement about getting involved in this committee is you know always keeping in, in the limelight some of the projects that we want to work on, even though we can't do everything every year. But I mean, we got to keep it in our memory bank and say, okay, these are the things that we're going to strive for. And you can knock them off and knock them off. As long as we keep the focus on the big ones, which is like irrigation, I can say, and working with the town for the finance department on that. Yeah. Well, John, you weren't here because you were ill, but all the members that were here expressed interest in getting more involved in goals and priority setting. Everyone did. But we don't seem to have a, a real vehicle to do that. I, I felt I, the letter that I wrote Clem was. So I went from our last meeting to this meeting and did absolutely nothing. There was nothing to do. We, we couldn't really talk to one another. I wrote a letter to Clem, but he felt he couldn't share it because it would be violating open meeting laws. But yet, other pe people are talking to one another. We should be able to have some groups meeting other than here where we're he hearing from a person from conservation and a per and someone else giving another report to plan. This isn't necessarily the only time I think we, we have to set goals and priorities. Even though I'm new, I do listen to your meetings and have attended many. So now is an opportunity for someone like me and other committee members who are interested in finding a vehicle for that kind of involvement. You know, maybe what we should do, too, we have a meeting once a month, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have a meeting twice a month, every other couple months or whatever, and have that one meeting just dedicated to goals or priorities or 
anything that a, a committee member would want to bring up at that meeting for discussion. And That's a possibility. We don't go over numbers or anything. We just focus on stuff that yeah. people yeah. would like to uh, discuss. We've, we've done it in the past. we have an agenda. Yeah. And if a person feels strongly about it, they come prepared and present their views, and we have a discussion. Yeah, and, and it doesn't have to be anything that costs money either. We have a, a lot of, as I said in my letter, you know, we're, we have our ears to the ground. People are talking to us. We have many things that we could share to help Roman uh, make our world a better place, in a sense. I'd just like to have that opportunity. I agree with that. Yeah, because I don't necessarily disagree with anything on the short-term or long-term plan, John. It's just that when... No, 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 no. <laughs> And I agree 100% that the irrigation system absolutely needs to be the number one priority. Right. It's just that we don't spend more than 10, five, 10 minutes ever talking amongst ourselves as a committee about, let's review the priorities. Do we still think they're all perfectly in the right priority order? Oh, geez, no, maybe number four should become number six and number seven should become number four. Great. We agree that at the committee? Or no, we agree as a committee, everything is exactly how, as it should be for the next year. Okay, good, we're done. But that should, be a, a, that should be a very significant agenda item unto itself. What are our priorities? Or we have a planning session. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Right. Exactly. Maybe a couple times in the last trimester of the year or something, just to uh, yeah. focus yeah. on some yeah. of the things that we want when, to When does things have to be, if you're gonna put anything on the, the budget, I mean, on the town meeting, when does it have to be done by February, um, January? Before that, um, uh, maybe the fall is when you do the planning meetings. Yeah, that's the t that's the time to do it. Um, I'm expecting. Well, I'm, getting the I'm getting the feedback from the. I'm hearing from different people, Carol, if you included, that maybe we should have a meeting. It doesn't have to be a priority in terms of the goals, but just in terms of feedback of what's happening at Greenberg Valley an insight that you can, you can provide or all of us can provide to the community as far as what's happening and what we should do in terms of developing new policies moving forward. Are we allowed to meet like that? It has to be a formal meeting. Well, we can have a yeah. formal meeting. And we, okay. yeah, yeah, right. or, or workshop or, yeah. you know, it's, because uh, we've done it in the past and. Uh, you have to advertise it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It has to be the done, agenda, you know, you know with just the formality. Like Posted notice, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, that fine. Good. fine. And we could ask people to come with any revisions to the vision statement, too. We'll see if we can, yeah. you know, maybe do the priorities first, and if we have time, do the vision statement, see if we can knock off both in a planning session. Ha has the golf committee voted to approve a three-hole short game course for juniors? No. Uh, the, the only step that we've taken thus far is uh, the commitment of uh, monies, correct Roman, for, you know, design and study. The design was, the, the design and study, um, that, that was a town meeting article uh, for FY21 that was pulled because of COVID, so so they, they pulled that article. So that article um, for the for uh, thirty thousand dollars to I think I think it was thirty thousand dollars to design and do a feasibility study for it, it was going to transfer into this upcoming town meeting. Uh, but but we're not there yet to where we actually write the articles. But the, right. The, so uh, so in terms of the vision, it really shouldn't. My opinion would be it should not be part of the vision at this point. Vision of the for goals. Well, the, 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 that, yeah, would, I, that I, wouldn't I, be in the vision statement, yeah, yeah, period. Right. right. Or the putting complex. Or the, right. anything putting like that. That's not part of That's your too vision. Specific, too specific. It's not part of the vision statement. It, it is the revised vision statement. But that was, yeah, but that was just. Proposal. Yeah, right. Yeah. We right. Yeah, no. no. Yep, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah? Yeah, I think 
it was John, right? John Wheeler. Who, John Wheeler. Who had yep. said, you know, think five, ten years out. Okay? So it's a little different, Carol, than what you described. I mean, that that's your view of it, and it may be the correct view. But, but we were told to think five, ten years out, ideally, what would you like to see? And, you know, it was top notch sports and, you know, customer friendly and, and inviting all folks to play and, and the encouraging pop. youth golf, et cetera. I, I think there's a constant theme of, of what you want in the vision statement, if, I, if I've heard it. I mean, it's in John's. I, I mean, I, if I was going to take John's, I, the only thing I'd pull out is develop a putting complex and a three hole shot game course for juniors. I think that's covered under invest. Invest in support junior in junior programs or invest exactly. in support in junior programs. But that would be on the the short and or long term yeah, goal. It could be on a strategic plan. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> for John Crook's draft. Yeah, for John Crook's draft. Yeah. yeah. There's just so many Johns around. <laughs> I know. Well, we okay. don't have to determine that now. No. We run out of time. Yeah, we are running out of uh, time. Uh, well, you know, as it stands now, uh, you know, we do have John correct. Uh, we have a strategic plan in place. We've we've had one, you know, that's been recognized, uh, you know, by the selectmen for the last five years, every year. And Steve, that uh, the important point I thought that Roman was trying to make is the fact that. Uh, there's always been a nice uh, uh, synergy between uh, the, the golf uh, director, uh, his his vision and goals, and, and what this committee has put forward. So that's why I see the necessity of, uh, you know, at least having a plan in place, uh, as outlined here, that certainly can be modified, Steve, as we go along. I, I don't see any loggerhead there. There is no loggerhead in my mind other than the fact that we don't talk about it. It's never well, an agenda I mean, item. You, know, I, you don't get to hear everybody's opinion well, on what the priority should be. I am going to be very pushbackish on this fact. We have not met in person for over a year. And basically this is one meeting and we've had one meeting prior. Think about it. You know, as far as those kinds of interactions, I think they're pretty uh, normal when we do meet together, but we haven't. That wasn't our fault, you know? So uh, I, I think going forward, certainly. Going forward, you know, we have we a can, chance to resolve we have, we have a chance to make up time. So. Hey, it was a great meeting today. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in any event, uh, you know, however, uh, whatever the disposition of the committee is to leave that, what say you? Like what? The, the strategic well, I mean, plan. We, we have a strategic plan. Yeah. We can change it going forward. Um, I think it's important for the director of golf to know that we support that effort. Can we? So I would move that, you know, we work with the existing strategic plan and go forward with planning sessions in the fall to further enhance and, and refine that. Uh, but at the moment, you know, we need we need to stand behind what we've been talking about for a number of years. So that's in the form of a motion. In the form of a motion. Could I have a second? You have a second behind me. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. It's unanimous. Paul, thank you. Uh, and. Even though we're over the time budgeted and allocated, uh, Steve, I, I thought that was important. He sent me a, a text message. Uh, I'm not trying to shortchange you, but the floor is yours. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Is, is anyone You have to pressed? be out of here at 630? Yeah, the, the Board of Health. But they're meeting in the Griffin room, so it shouldn't be an issue. Steve? I just wanted to talk as a committee about as we get ready for the budget process, mm -hmm. what the strategy is. Um, you know, I've been, I've been fairly involved and I met with the, with, with, with 
Clem and, and, and Roman and uh, the town administrator and uh, Carol uh, and Carol, uh, mm -hmm. the the woman from finance, and it's still it's it's still not a clear cut budget process here, and they, they don't want it to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, the town administrator and or the CFO. But be that as it may, just I think we should all have input to what is the strategy going forward. We had a very unique situation last year where Roman got guidance from uh, the hierarchy in the town that, hey, your budget's pretty much going to be flat because of COVID and, and remnants of the tornado, et cetera, et cetera. Wholly unique, unusual circumstance, understood. But going forward, that's no longer, that's no longer an issue. So as we go forward on the budget, I'll just throw out some ideas. We've seen about a 25% increase in the utilization of the golf course from a quote unquote typical year. It's like anything else. If you're using it 25% more of the time, you're going to need to spend more money just to maintain it at its previous status. If it was me, I would go right into the budget discussion saying, I want a 25% budget next year. Because A, we're, we're utilizing the golf course by, 20, by more than 25% than historic average. And B, it gener we're generating that much more revenue than we ever have. So it's no incremental burden to the town for the run operation and the running of the golf course. And yet, if we were able to get close to that, think about what we could do. You could add some staff. I mean, yeah. Sean and his crew are killing themselves trying to deal with, I mean, you haven't added staff in years, even though the utilization has gone up. The more the golf course gets utilized, the, more you, the bigger burden on you and your staff and your people. You're going to need to spend more on fertilization and watering and maintenance and utilizing your equipment more, et cetera, et cetera. We could potentially do maybe two years of what we had initially planned for uh, the first steps on the irrigation system if we could get that sort of increase. But instead, we, you know, we get treated like every other department in the, in the town as just an expense. Yet, we're in a very unique situation where we're generating revenue to offset that expense, and we need to stay competitive in order to continue to generate that revenue to offset, to offset that expense. And if we don't keep the golf course up, if it takes us five years to upgrade the irrigation system, if we don't get the right level of support and help that Roman and his staff need, we're not going to be able to provide high-level customer service. And we're, 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 we're not going to meet the mission. We're not going to be able to meet the strategic plans. And we're going to put the revenue stream at risk, which is not good for either the golf course or the town of, of power. So I'm very curious to see what other people's approaches are uh, on, on how how we approach this, this, this upcoming budget process. Steve, I'm in total agreement. I, I mean, at the core of what you said, uh, and it's, it's been a long time thought of mine, the fact that when the select board decides to create an umbrella in their approach to the budget, all departments treat it exactly the same, you know, as I've insisted. We are not. We don't reflect exactly the same type of uh, footprint that recreation does, or you know, name another department. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're you're spot on. I one thing that I've uh, seen lately, and I've been trying to track it, is the fact that uh, you know when you have good people on staff to retain them, hello, it's salary and wages. And the fact is, you know, are we retaining that kind of competitiveness? Because if we don't, 
we'll be out of luck. I mean, people will will seek employment elsewhere. So, Steve, I'm, one thing I'd mention, sorry, I didn't yeah. want to cut you off, no. but one thing I would mention that is pre-COVID, um, we, they, they, the um, Board of Selectmen, the Finance Committee, the Town Administrator, and Finance Director were all very open to increases. So I, I used to be able to put in for increases for specific lines. They would not accept a 25%. They, they would want to know exactly how many new hours you need and uh, how many new supplies. And so I need to spell that out, but that's, well, that was fine. I, I used to um, um, you know, write an introduction to my presentation that would say uh, increased facility usage has created a need for these things. And they, they want it spelled out. They, they want to know exactly how many hours. Uh, it's got to also fit their, um, the budget message from the town administrator and the board of selectmen so I can say, yes, we're following your message, except in, in these areas that we're requesting something beyond your message. Well, what Carol? if we got our, our liaison more involved? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> would, <clears throat> I would certainly be glad to approach Mr. Howell. Uh, I think, though, Clem, wouldn't you agree? Clem's always involved in these discussions. The, the town administrator has told us what's going to happen. And what, what's going to happen is he's going to get his bus budget message from the selectmen, yeah. and then he's going to sit down with Clem and myself, Clem representing the committee, and then my, myself, and we're going to discuss the budget for the upcoming yeah. year, what, what our needs are as far as town meeting, um, town meeting articles, and we would say exactly that. Well, we, we, we were going to need this. And, and I understand all of that, Roman, and I agree with it, but the budget message from the Board of Selectmen and the TA, yeah. it's not an edict. It's a message. It's a right. recommendation. Yeah. Do we have every right and obligation as as a golf committee to push back on if it doesn't meet the, the best needs of us getting our strategic plans done to meet our mission? And so we've and always done that. that that's yeah. always been the case is we follow the message, except here are the areas that we're asking for more, except last year. And I think last year being the unique situation, I think it was correct to not push back. I oh, think I, I, so. I couldn't agree with you more. So yeah. I, I, that, that, that's always been in place that they've been receptive yeah. to our request beyond their message uh, to a degree. Steve, Steve, I, I would agree with you. If you were not, if you were a normal business, you'd do exactly what you're saying. What I see in this town, especially since some of the things got shot down, is is the phenomenal. sensitivity to the impact of anything on the tax rate. Yeah. Yeah. It seems yeah. like they're afraid to spend money because of the, the impact on the tax rate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you can, you know, I, I totally agree with what you're suggesting, but I don't know how you crack that um, mentality that says... And, and, and I guess the way I would approach it is we're not going to, we're not going to negatively impact the tax rate. I believe we're making money. Well, I believe that Cranberry Valley is self-supporting. And with a 25% budget increase, it would still be self-supporting. And if we don't get a sizable budget increase, we're, going, we're at a greater risk of being not self-supporting because the quality will go down, the usage will go down, I mean, you can't ask yeah. Roman staff to take care of tw over 25% more rounds with the exact same number of people and maintain the same level of customer service. And actually, it's you're telling, fewer. You're telling a yeah, worker, it's, it's here, do, do a quarter or more work, add an extra 10 hours to your, to your work day, no big raise, and oh, by the way, keep a smile on your face and give excellent customer service. That's, that's a big risk to the tax oh, base. I, I, I agree. but. I just don't see that in the Board of Selectmen. I, I, I really see a group that's very timid r with respect to doing anything that jeopardizes the tax rate. And, and, and I don't disagree, but we should make the pitch and get them on record. Because yep. if that's the mindset of yep. the Selectmen, yep. the public needs to know that that's the mindset Steve, of their elected I, officials. One thing I mentioned to you, Steve, as far as how, how it's gone historically, is uh, if we can, in the initial meetings with the town administrator and the finance director, 
that's where the, um, if they support what we're doing, it, it's always been approved further down the line. So that's where it, the reality kicks in. Because once they support it, then when we go to the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, they've never cut from our, any of our requests. It, that's all been a formality. I need to present it, and they, and they rubber stamp it. So, it. so how do we as a committee be actively involved in what those requests are going to be? Not that I don't trust you, Roman, but you're really busy. <laughs> and, well, and, and, this night, and you've got a lot of experience and a lot of intellectual capability here in this room. How do we help create that message and create those requests with some justification so that it increases the probability of getting incremental funds so we can, we can do things? It shouldn't just be you and Clem. You've got other members of the, of, of, of the committee as well. Maybe it's a separate meeting. Once again, I keep, I'm sorry to keep doing this. But I would love to brainstorm with this group about the approach and, and what should we ask for. Oh. I mean, should we ask yeah. for an extra couple hundred What's thousand? What's reality? So we so that body, but, but, the, but two quick audience. points. Number one, I think we've been very well served by Roman and Clem. And I'm very comfortable with that. And I don't mind the, having the opportunity to discuss it further. In 10 minutes, I'm meeting a contractor who wants to check the services rendered, so I'm going to excuse myself. I'm going to pay the guy yes. for the work he's done for uh, me. I do have a question. I apologize. When, thanks, Paul. Paul, thank you. Thank you, Paul. You did a projected of one million eight. Is that down from your two million one? Yeah, so that projection, I, I, you, you didn't know this, Carol, because I, I, uh, I explained this all to the committee. That's the projection that the finance director has for us for this, this fiscal year. Um, so that coordinates with all of her reporting. The one million eight. One one point eight for this current yeah, year. Yeah, I, but you're projecting. You're saying you're projecting two. two we 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 made two point one last fiscal year. I would I would say we'll, you know if I was going to project it'd be around two million again this year. I think there may be a little a slight correction for the reasons I mentioned as far as the uh, annual pass sales happening late last year and, and such. Expenses are less than that. Yeah. So. But uh, but uh, again, they, they, we've had so many discussions on this. There, there there's a wide range of of uh, undeclared costs. I think uh, that, that um. Working with the town. That, the, um, the, the town. So great. undeclared costs are this in the private in business. Room. Yeah, those are things. Pensions, medical expenses. Those they, are things that they don't get lumped into Romans. Yeah. No, yeah. they get lumped indirects. into the whole town. The indirect, the indirect expenses. expenses. Well, no, no, yeah. no the, the, the benefits are itemized. They're in the town budget, itemized. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not allocated to the golf course. No, but, but it's easy math yeah. to do that. Yeah. The only thing that, that really isn't allocated are the shared service. And we met with the town administrator yeah. and the CFO, and I was there, and I asked, let us figure out what these town shared services are so we can do an allocation. And what did they? They refused. It's not that they refused, they refused but I think. Fine. They refused. No, Steve, think about <laughs> it. I think Carol Coppola said that basically she'd have to hire Roman 10 people. Which is a lot of bull. They refused. Well, the, 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 that's they what refused. you said. The big it'd point be, that it would be very easy to estimate it, like most businesses do, and not hire not ten like outside consultants to do it. Yeah. They use that ex as an excuse on their refusal to do that. The the big point though that they made there that, that I think is so important at, at that meeting is that the golf is not independent of the town. The golf is the town. The town is golf. Our golf money is town money. It's not separate. And that was the big point they made at that meeting. So, they, you know, again, what, all, I was, all I was looking for was, was for clarification. If they did do an estimate, and we could get that undetermined cost, we could do a true, this is, this is our total cost. We're either making money versus or we're not. This is, this is our total revenue, and it's all the town's money. And if the town policy is, whatever you make above your costs in Cranberry Valley, we keep. Fine. Say that. Tell the public that. Tell our members that. Let us know that so when we go to do rates and fees discussions, we, have, we, we know that. They don't want that to be public knowledge. But well, we know that. But, that's how they operate. I mean, that's how that they doesn't mean we can't change it. Because you're the general fund. Yes. They do it. I mean, I don't know how we're going to change that. 
No. I mean, I thought the only way to do it was become an enterprise fund. Yeah. And you don't want that. Yeah, you don't want that. Okay. But you know, I mean, then you then you get into things like, well, you know, fiscal responsibility. We well, should, we should spend every last nickel we can <laughs> because yeah. if we make money, we don't get any extra. If we lose money, we don't get penalized. So what the hell? Well, the the good news, though, I, I think I think Steve, it's true that that we we've we've made a lot of money in the past, and and as I mentioned, when we go to the town and and have requests for up, upgrades to our budget, it's always been approved. So I mean, I think I, we're good partners. I think they they look at us as we're good partners. There's an acknowledgement of what we're doing, and if I if I go to them in, in the budget time to say we need this to keep doing what we're doing, it's never been so. Turned so, off. so if we think we're if we think we're quote unquote without the itemization, close to break even or a little bit positive. How do we tie the budget request, to Roman's point, to the things in the strategic plan so we can say, here's the things we want to do the main. We want to do the irrigation system, and it's a million dollars, and we were thinking it was going to take us five years. How about you give us an extra $200,000 next year, and that cuts it down to four. And if we, if we have really high utilization, in the upcoming fiscal year, we do it again. And maybe we get it done in two and a half years instead of five. Well, they've given us the, the, the vehicles where we've got the, the golf improvement fund is, I mean, as John mentioned earlier, thank gosh we have these funds. These funds are what we operate out of. So, you know, we're going to do the irrigation system. We're going to do it all at once. And, it, you know, once we get this quote, we're going to find out what the debt schedule is. And that's a whole separate deal. They, they definitely want to separate that from the operating budget. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't muddy the water by having those two things um, uh, together. I, I, think, I think what we're doing out of the golf improvement fund is uh, when they approved us to have that fund, that they basically said, you take care of all your own projects, and right. that, that's our mechanism. So, so the cut, the cut file was the same way. Same way. Yeah. We, they so allowed we us to create the infrastructure fund. We, 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 had tr we had tried before, and it never passed until we created that never. fund. Yeah. Roman, just that's let me point. ask a Jack. point of reference. What's the largest increase you've ever gone in to ask them for? Not much. Yeah. I mean, if you went in for a 10% increase, do you think you'd get it? You know, once again, I can't just say an increase. Hey, I've got to break down why exactly. Yeah, but, to, but, but, but if it but turned out to be 10%, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I've, if you close the meeting, Clem, I, I'd probably speak off the cuff on some yeah. of the items. But there are things um, employee-wise that I need to accomplish for the next budget, that, that uh, a, a reorganization of, of a type that uh, is required. Yeah. So Should we close the meeting? Can we, yeah, oh. motion to adjourn? Yeah. Second. Okay. Second. And second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Steve, would you yeah, hit the stop? Carol, you're the expert. Oh, Larry. How are you? There's a How do you stop? Health? They meet in the dark. Board of Health. Are they meeting in the Griffins room or here? Oh,